Okay, all our speaker here already. Okay. Yeah, so please, Martin. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to ICANX. Today, we will have the final defense of our, our Young Scientist Awards. The panel consists of um, my, uh, Professor Christian Nyhaus, Paul Samori, Jürgen Broga, and Zeng Wan, and myself. These are our nine speakers to today who are contenders for the Young Scientist Award. We will have the first batch today, and then we'll have another one uh, next week, and the following week we'll fi uh, finalize and announce the awards. Each speaker will have 15 minutes uh, of presentation and a maximum of five minutes question. I will um, request that you stop when your time is up and we'll jump straight into the question. The final defense begins immediately on our first speaker is Yan Wei. Yan, share your slides. Yeah, sure. We're good. Yeah, should I start? Yep. Okay, great. Um, let me bring, sorry, let me bring the laser point. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, evening, everyone. My name is Wei Yan. I'm a Nanyang Assistant a, a Professor at NTU Singapore. First of all, I'd like to thank the committee for selecting me as a finalist for this award. Today, I will present uh, Intelligent Fiber Electronics and Optoelectronics. As we all know, wafer-based optoelectronic and electronic devices, such as computer chips, have revolutionized the world. However, they are plain and rigid. Many emerging technologies require flexible, soft, wearable electronics and optoelectronics. A major challenge in the field is how to realize micron and nanoscale materials, architecture, and devices over on conventional substrates that are flexible, stretchable, highly curved, and large area. Achieving such a capability will allow us to address many scientific and technological challenges in many important fields, such as neuroscience, healthcare, smart textiles, and robotics. We are particularly interested in fiber-shaped devices. The key technology we exploit for the processing of materials and device fabrication is thermal joint. This is the same approach used in industry for the manufacturing of optic fibers. We first make a microscopic preform, a scaled up model of the fiber. This preform has all of the materials that the fiber has in the same arrangement that is necessary in the fiber. We then heat the preform up the materials become soft when we pour the preform all of the materials end up flowing next to each other while keeping their relative position and shrinking down in dimensions, thus forming the one-dimensional fiber. We can integrate different materials such as semiconductors, metals, dielectric materials, and even high-performance chips into the fiber. Compared with optic fibers that exhibit a single material, single geometry, and a single function, the fiber here possesses multiple materials, sophisticated geometries, and complex functionalities. In this talk, I will show you some scientific and technological breakthroughs I have made in the field, and hopefully I can give you a little bit of flavor of the important applications of this fiber in many fields. Specifically, I will talk about uh, number one, ultra-long nanoscale conductive amorphous metal fibers. Number two, single crystal semiconducting optoelectronic fibers. Number three, piezoelectric fibers enabled fabric ears. This will cover three important types of materials in the fiber. They are semiconductors, metals, and dielectric materials. So when we pour the preform into a tiny fiber, a very fundamental question you may ask me is what the minimum feature size of the fiber material is. Take crystalline metals, for example. They break up into spheres when the feature sizes reach a few micrometers due to the plateau Rayleigh instability, a phenomenon which is in analogy to the water thread flowing from a tap that breaks up into droplets. In fact, the fabrication of fiber electrodes with nanoscale feature sizes, continuity, and excellent conductivities remained unresolved for decades. 
Here, we discover that the instability time of a fluid is sensitive to the fiber core to fiber connecting viscosity ratio. For example, if we can achieve of a ratio of 30, the instability time will be three orders of magnitude higher compared to a crystalline metals. This might allow us to fabricate actual known nanoscale fiber electrodes. Indeed, based on this fundamental understanding, we for the first time demonstrated that we are able to fabricate globally aligned, uniformly sized amorphous metal fibers with extremely wide range of feature sizes down to 40 nanometers and aspect ratios greater than 10 to the power of 10 via control over the viscosity ratio of fiber materials. These novel fibers possess excellent conductivity, very stable electrochemical properties. Exploiting these unique characteristics, we demonstrate the unique applications of the amorphous metal fiber for long-term uh, neural electric stimulation, electric recording, as well as a localized pharmacological manipulation in the deep brain of freely moving animals. As shown by this video, the rat is initially anesthetized. Upon electric stimulation or drug administration, the rat is able to walk or run normally. So apart from conductors, semiconductors are also the building blocks of many uh, important electronic or, op or optoelectronic devices. The incorporation of semiconductors into the fiber opens up a new field of optoelectronic fibers. For example, this work shows that the optoelectronic fiber detects photons. And the incorporation of this fiber into the military helmet delivers a disruptive technology for army defense and reconnaissance. However, the semiconductor in the previous fiber is either polycrystalline or amorphous. A major challenge in the field is how to fabricate a single crystal semiconducting optoelectronic fibers. To address this issue, here we proposed a strategy of modulating the interfacial energy of crystal planes of in fiber semiconductors. This technique enables single crystal semiconducting nanowire based optoelectronic fibers. The performance of such a fiber is even on par with some silicon based planar devices. We then integrate one optic fiber and two nanowire based photodetectors into a single fiber and use such a hybrid fiber for fluorescence imaging applications, as demonstrated by a EPFL logo here. The third type of important components in our fiber platform are dielectric materials. In the last part, I will show you innovative piezoelectric fibers enabled, enabled fabric ears. So talk about some context. So we know that sound is very critical for our everyday lives, right? In fact, the reason that, that I'm able to deliver this uh, speech today is because first I can emit sound, I can speak, right? The second reason is because my signal can be transmitted via the optic fibers. So sound is essential for communications, for educations, for medical diagnosis, and so on and so forth. So literally sound advanced the human civilization. Meanwhile, the story of human progress is intertwined with fabrics. So audible sound has been interacting with fabrics for thousands of years. There is an acoustic fabric or textile discipline. Surprisingly, acoustic fabrics had been exclusively exploited as sound absorbers dissipating acoustic signals with useful information into unusable heat. That's the reason why we use fabrics to control and reduce noise and vibrations. Inspired by the human auditory system, here we invented fabric ears that are composed of two functional domains. The first part is a high modulus fabric media that converts sound pressure into mechanical vibration. The second part is an oven fiber that conforms with the vibration of the fabric media and converts mechanical vibration into electric signals. To convert mechanical vibration into electric signals, we constructed a piezoelectric fiber. This fiber consists of a piezoelectric domain sandwiched between two carbon-based nanocomposite electrodes and each in contact with two copper wires. 
This assembly is then encapsulated within a soft cladding in an asymmetric way. We notice that the piezoelectric domain is not located in the center of the fiber, right? So there are three special designs for this fiber. Number one, the piezoelectric domain has a much higher modulus than that of the soft cladding. It turns out that this combination results in stress concentration in the piezoelectric domain, which is exactly what we want because this enables high energy uh, converse, uh, conversion efficiency. Number two, the design of this fiber is asymmetric, as I mentioned before. This again allows a high efficiency of energy conversion. The strain of a plane in a bent beam is proportional to its distance to the neutral axis plane. When the fiber is asymmetric, such a distance is large, and therefore a high strain is built up in the piezoelectric domain. If this uh, if this neutral axis plane is located in the piezoelectric domain, then the uh, built-up stress is very small and the output voltage will be super small. Number three is the innovative piezo composite during thermal joint. The polymer matrix undergoes plastic deformation while the rigid birotitanate nanoparticles maintain their morphologies unchanged. This induces the formation of pores around the nanoparticles in the fiber jaw direction. Such a porous structure is shown to be very sensitive to mechanical deformation, resulting in a piezoelectric coefficient D31 of around 50 picocoulomb per newton. We then constructed the fabric media using some high modulus yams as inspired by the rigid tympanic membrane of the human auditory system weaving the piezoelectric fiber into the high modulus fabric media forms this acoustic fabric or the fabric ears. That gives rise to extraordinary sensitivities compared to the lower modulus fabric. We then measured some beautiful vibration modes of the acoustic fabric. The higher modulus fabric exhibits lower order vibration modes where the piezoelectric fiber only bends towards one direction. So charges of the same type builds up additively on the electrodes, leading to a very high output voltage. For the lower homogeneous fabric, it exhibits higher order modes and different type of charges built on the electrodes, resulting in charge cancellation and thus a very small output voltage. We then integrate the fabric into, uh, into a short. Here, I speak to the short. Uh, The acoustic fabric. So this is my original speech, sound. right? This is a recorded electric signal. Uh, the acoustic fabric. And this is a recorded speech. Sound. As you can see, the recorded speech is pretty much identical to my original speech. And on the other hand, the short is also able to speak. Okay, so the short is playing music, right? Um, so we then integrate the two acoustic fabrics into a short uh, that is uh, capable of precisely detecting the sound direction, just like we have uh, uh, two ears to identify the sound source. Since the short is not only able to hear sound, but also to emit sound, we establish a bi-directional communication system based on two garments. This technology may be very useful for people who are part of hearing or speaking. Imagine that the person on the left is not able to speak, the short can speak for him. The person on the right has a hearing impairment and the short can assist in hearing for her. And we further integrate the fabric into a vest wearing such a stethoscope, the person is able to efficiently uh, hear his heart sound with important information of heartbeat rate, louder S1 and weaker S2, as well as as well as S1 split and S2 split. Heart disease is a leading horse of death, and our work provides an innovative technology for monitoring heart conditions in a comfortable, continuous, and real-time way. The patent has been purchased by a US company, and these are some product prototypes. Because this acoustic fabric is very sensitive to mechanical vibration, we have constructed an aerospace suit 
and use it in space to detect space dust in the context that uh, micro meteoroids and space debris pose significant threat to astronauts and satellites. This suit has been deployed at the International Space Station. It maintains the same performance after staying in space for 18 months. This work offers an important technology for efficient damage sensing in space. Uh, to conclude, fibers are essentially building blocks of a broad spectrum of antenna teeth. The incorporation of semiconductors, metals, and biological materials into the fiber enables a new generation of flexible, stretchable, wearable, biocompatible, and implantable electronics and optoelectronics. They are able to see, able to hear, speak, communicate, modulate temperature, harvest and store energy, sense and actuate, think, interface with the neurons. Fiber electronics and optoelectronics are emerging, delivering value-added services for our society. With this, I'd like to end my speech with thanking my group members at NTU, my collaborators at EPFL and MIT, as well as funding agencies. I'm very happy to take any questions or comments you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a very good and well-timed uh, presentation to the panel. Questions? And one in the panel can ask questions. Uh, maybe I can start. In, in your work on uh, measuring sound, you use natural fibers, and we know that uh, the diversity in uh, composition is very complex and broad. How do you uh, modulate for uh, stochastic perturbation to the quality of the fibers in your materials? Uh, you are talking about uh, uh, sound emission, right? Yeah, so, so when you mix, yeah. uh, yes. you mix okay. so, so with other materials. Yeah, yeah. So basically, for sound emission, we also use this appears or electric fibers. So the functional domain is this, uh, you know, nanocomposite uh, appears or electric material. It cannot only, uh, uh, you know, sense um, a night, a uh, sense sound, but also can detect a sound. And here, in order to emit audible sound, we have to input, uh, you know, a high voltage to drive the vibration of the fiber. When the fiber vibrates, it, uh, uh, you know, it brings the vibration of the fabric. So the sound you, you heard just now actually is, uh, you know, it comes from the vibration of the whole, uh, you know, the, the entire of the fabric that is driven by the piezoelectric fiber oven in the shot. Yeah. Maybe I could also ask a question. Um, yeah. In terms of, materials uh, development or maybe materials combination developments, what would be uh, the next steps? But what are the challenges that are still? Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, there are so many, so many challenges, you know, uh, you know, big questions in our field. Uh, for sure, materials, you know, are very important, right? It builds up the, builds the foundation of the device, the performance, and even the applications of, you know, the fiber platform. So. Uh, for I would say for the you know for the next phase uh, we need to you know control over the microstructure and the nanostructure of the materials in order to further improve the performance uh, of the fiber devices. Uh, just to take the acoustic fabric for example, even though I show that the vest the person is wearing is able to hear the heartbeat sound, in fact the vest has to uh, you know. Uh, interface with the chest you know you know very tightly in a very tight way why is because the performance of this fiber is still not uh, you know not sufficiently high so i would say uh, in terms of materials we have to further improve the performance and we have to uh, you know further control the microstructures and the architectures and even uh, you know the the whole fiber architectures the fabric architectures to uh, meet the uh, re real world applications yeah, very short answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the answers. So we move to our next. Uh, I think you're going to. Uh, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. Is there just still time out? for a short question? Is there time yes, for yeah. a short question? Uh, they, they there's increased um, uh, concern and awareness about sustainability, about, you know, reducing waste. So how about your material in textile uh, at the end of life? 
Oh yeah, that's 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 a very good question. Actually, I just have uh, uh, you know received a fun funding about this uh, topic is to develop a sustainable fiber uh, fiber electronics and optical electronic systems and devices. So in fact, right now all the polymers, right, all the polymers actually are synthetic polymers. And so actually, they uh, you know in order to fabricate them, we have to use uh, we have to use uh, consume the energy, right, the, uh, uh, and. Uh, and in order to decompose them, actually, it also uh, brings a lot of pollution to our environment. So one actually strategy to address this problem is to, you know, use some uh, natural polymers to replace these synthetic polymers in order to create a, a sustainable uh, devices. So we are working on that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We let's uh, for the sake of time, let's move to our next speaker, Dr. Nasri. Uh, take us away. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me well? Yep. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, I'm Nushin. Uh, I'm the head of nanotech laboratory at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. And today I want to uh, walk you through the journey I had. I started since 2013 when I started my PhD at the Australian National University in Canberra. So the topic of my talk today is SunWatch, which is a smart UV nanosensing watch. Uh, and the reason that I'm actually fascinated about uh, UV sensors and I start thinking about this as my PhD project is that because in Australia, uh, there is no UV off season for most of the country. Uh, as you can see in this map here, uh, no matter which part of the country you live, uh, north uh, on the top uh, in the north or uh, in the south of Australia, for the most of the uh, season, uh, you will be exposed to uh, high, very high, or even extreme level of UV. And uh, from one side, UV is actually, uh, a, a, we need to be exposed to UV uh, because it helps us to develop uh, vitamin D, which is essential for our metabolism. But overexposure to UV can cause many significant problems. Uh, can be, we, can, we can get sunburn, we can get uh, premature aging, uh, eye damaging, but the most significant uh, problem of being exposed to uh, UV is to develop a skin cancer. So here in Australia, as you can see, Australia and New Zealand, they have the highest mortality rate of a skin cancer in the whole world. Uh, we call it national cancer here in Australia. Two out of three Australians will be diagnosed by a skin cancer by the age of 17. And every five hours, one Australian dies from skin cancer. So when I moved to Australia at the end of 2012 to start my PhD project uh, from uh, January 2013, uh, I was on a governmental scholarship and I really wanted to work on something that can benefit because government scholarship is coming from taxpayers' money. And I really was uh, very keen to work on a project that can benefit, directly benefit the people of in this country. And that's how my journey of working on uh, nanosensing devices that can help us to um, uh, adjust to moderate uh, the, the exposure time uh, to UV. That's how my journey started. Uh, so the challenge number one is that, okay, so in order to make a device, like a very like a wearable device, we need uh, a UV sensor, which is a very high performing UV sensor, because when you, when you want to make it as a wearable device, you should actually have a very high performance to be able to to work in that scale. And at the same time, you wanted the device to have a very low power consumption. So uh, when I started my PhD, I used this uh, uh, system, is a nanofabrication system named flame spray pyrolysis. It's a very fast, very efficient technique to fabricate uh, thousands and millions or billions of nanoparticles. Uh, and uh, so it works based on uh, a flammable liquid that you have uh, and uh, a metal atoms uh, that you can have dissolved in that flammable liquid. You can purge it through this, uh, this needle. There is a high pressure oxygen atomization happen at the tip of the needle when the liquid is coming out of the needle. So you're gonna, end, you're gonna have a combustion happening here. There is a nucleation, there is coagulation of nanoparticles and then agglomeration. And because of the uh, temperature gradients, very high temperature here, and because you can do your sample in a water-cooled substrate holder, so there is a temperature gradient. So all these nanoparticles, they move based on a Brownian motion, they go up and they sit on the surface of your, your substrate. You can literally coat any substrate that you want using this technology. You can coat uh, papers, you can coat a piece of, a piece of uh, clothes, for example, 
The beauty of this technique is that you can have a control on every parameter. You can control the film thickness. You can control particle size. You can even control the porosity of your film. The one that you see here on the uh, top right of your, your screen is a zinc oxide film with 98% porosity, which means only 2% of your film is actually bulk material. And that actually makes it very, very promising for variable technologies, for uh, sensing technologies, because as you can see, all these glasses here are coated with a very thick layer of zinc oxide, like 10, maybe 15 micrometer of uh, film thickness. But because of the high level of porosity of the film, uh, there is a above 95% transparency towards uh, visible light. And that makes it very promising to be used for a wide variety of applications, including uh, to be used as a, in, in optical, for example, devices in variable technologies. Uh, so in 2015, this was the first time we actually introduced a highly porous nanostructure as the UV sensor. And we were also very surprised when we tested the, device for, uh, the sensor for the first time. We were very surprised to see that it was um, performing way better than any other uh, sensing uh, technology reported in the literature. In order to make a very good UV sensor, what you need, you need a high signal to noise ratio. In order to have that one, you need a very low dark current, which means when you test your device under the dark condition, you literally should have very, very small, tiny current uh, in like a scale of nanoamp or even better picoamp or femtoamp. Uh, and then when you shine the UV light, you need to have a very high uh, photogenerated uh, current. So if you have a high signal to noise ratio, you can actually look at that material as a promising material to be used as a photo sensor. When we tested this device initially in 2015, at such a low voltage of only one volt, it actually is promising as a UV, as a variable device, we can, we can literally operate the system with a very tiny battery, as well as at a very low light density of even less than 100 microwatt per square centimeter, we ended up with almost 10 million in terms of signal to the noise ratio, which was way better than the state-of-the-art technology and is still one of the highest reported high uh, signal to the noise ratio. Initially, it was actually surprising to us as well. We couldn't find a very solid reason behind why uh, this 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 um, this nanostructure is actually uh, significantly higher, whatever is reported in the literature. Let's dig a little bit into how this uh, UV photo detection works. What is how the mechanism works? In order to um, um, simplify it, imagine that you have all these zinc oxide. These are all these zinc oxide nanoparticles that you have, and zinc oxide is an n-type semiconductor, which means that you're going to have extra electrons which are going to just um, uh, uh, move inside your material and create that tiny current, which we call it dark current. But we wanted to have a very low dark current to have a high performing material. So the, the, the photo detection performance works based on the physisorption, the absorption and desorption of oxygen molecules from the surface. Imagine that you have your zinc oxide, you live it in the uh, normal uh, atmosphere. The oxygen from the atmosphere sits on the surface of your material and capture that extra electron from your entire material and create that tiny, tiny electron depleted layer here. So now in order to make your material uh, have a low dark current, the best idea is that to actually make your particles smaller and smaller and smaller until your particle size is smaller than twice the balance. And if you do that, then the entire particle would be fully electron depleted and you're going to end up with a very low dark current. But this was not very new. Everybody know at the time that in order to make a low dark current, you have to make your particles smaller. Again, why our sample was performing better than literature. So now let's see what is happening when I test an ultra porous film compared when I test the dense film and imagine that both of them has exactly the same particle size and the particle is smaller than twice the balance. So in the dark condition, when I have a porous film, the oxygen from the atmosphere can just simply penetrate to the bottom layers of my film. So the entire film, no matter how thick it is, it can be 20 micrometer, it can be 100 micrometer thick, the entire film will be electron depleted. 
while in terms of the, in the case of dense film, only the surface of your film can be uh, exposed to oxygen. So the, 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 the bulk of the material, the inner part of the material will not be exposed to the oxygen, but won't be fully electron depleted. So in order to reduce the uh, dark current here, the only chance you have is to make a very, very thin film because the thicker film, they actually increase the dark current in your sample. Now, if you have the UV illumination, the same case happens. So the UV light can penetrate the bottom layers of your porous film and the entire film is now contributing to generating photocurrent. While in the case of dense film, only the surface is actually doing that. And that's how our sample and our morph the morphology that we created uh, ended up with a super low, like a picoamp level of uh, dark current and macro or even milliamp level of photocurrent, which makes it very promising. There are many other challenges that we face, and because of time, I can't walk you through one, uh, all of them one by one. I picked the most interesting one. This is my the favorite challenge that we tackle, how we can distinguish UVA from UVB. Because if you want to use this device as um, a technology that can help you to, uh, that can help people to prevent skin cancer, you should be able to know how much UVA or how much UVB is absorbed by your skin, because these two uh, UV uh, range, they actually cause different types of damage on human skin. So if you talk about zinc oxide as our main material, zinc oxide is sensitive to any wavelengths below 370 nanometer, which is a combination of both UVA and UVB. Now the challenge is how we can distinguish that. So what we did, we added another layer on the top of that from silicon dioxide, which is a space layer. And everything is done by the same technology, flame spray pyrolysis. This space layer is dielectric and is actually separating the top layer, which is titanium dioxide from the bottom layer, which is zinc oxide. Why we use titanium dioxide? Because two reasons. First of all, titanium dioxide is sensitive to any wavelengths below 350 nanometer, which is kind of close to uh, UVB, UVB range. But another reason we added titanium dioxide is that because titanium dioxide has an indirect band gap, which means that if you change the thickness of titanium dioxide, you can actually tune the band gap a little bit. So you can actually uh, move from, like, let's say, 325 nanometer to 350 nanometer. Now, what happens if you have all these, like the LED, if you have solar simulator and you have all these UVA and UVB lights? Anything below 350 nanometer will be absorbed by top layer, but because of this space layer, the top layer is not communicating to the, at least the electrode. So the top layer is not contributing the signal you receive from your device because this is separating that. So anything below 350 is absorbed by the top layer. What reach to the bottom layer is the wavelengths above 350. But bottom layer is only sensitive to wavelengths below 370 nanometer. So by doing that, what you can do instead of having a zinc oxide, which is sensitive to all UVA and UVB, you can actually create a band selective UV detector, which can only be sensitive to UVA. There are lots of other challenges in finding the optimal condition in terms of particle size, in terms of how you can make the device faster. And then in 2018, we took it for the first time outside of the laboratory to make it as a, a kind of a variable devices. We tested on a, like a PCB board to make sure that it works and is promising. And in 2020, for the first time, we actually make it as a variable devices. In these variable devices, everything is just bought from the like the offshore, uh, uh, like an Arduino and a microcontroller, just to make sure that the device is, is working as a variable device. It is a bit chunky. It is not actually very uh, um, comfortable in order to, to vary it, but it gives us a very promising data. We develop an app that can tell you what is the UV index. We can also communicate this to the end user, and you can actually save the data up to three months. You can actually see here in this very short video that my student is testing the device in uh, the beach. You can see there is a screen on the device. You can also see that there is a there is an app developed which can make it easier to read the data. But then later, 
we end up, we try to make it smaller. So we develop our own PCB. So you can see that the sensor is here and this, uh, we make it significantly, make it smaller. We even add the temperature and humidity sensor on the PCB board in order to make the calibrate the sensor based on what is the temperature and what is the uh, humidity. And this is the roadmap that we have. We started from here and currently we receive funding from Cancer Australia to actually work to make the device even smaller as a clippable device that you can clip it anywhere on your sunglass, on your hat, on your collar of your uh, actually uh, shirt and it can actually do the same thing. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your time and of course all this hard work is actually because of my brilliant students who are doing the, the experiment in the laboratory. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very well timed talk. Uh, we have time for two questions. Yeah, Matt? I'll ask a quick question. Um, so uh, interesting work. I'm just curious uh, for this technique, you use flame uh, to produce this thin film. Um, how does it compare with other processes? For example, if people are using solution process to deposit similar nanoparticles on substrate, uh, what's the unique advantage of your flame deposition? Thanks. Uh, there are uh, several advantages. The main one is that uh, I'm not aware of any other technique that can uh, go up, uh, can create a film with like 99 or even 90. Uh, 98, 99% porosity. And uh, uh, we strongly believe that the main reason that these tiny devices can still create such a high photocurrent is just because of the high level of porosity that the film has. So if you use a solution-based technique like hydrothermal or other technique, you can't usually go like the sprinkling or other technique, you can't go above 50 or maybe even higher 60% porosity in your film. Oh, so those process, it would be more densely packed, right? Absolutely. So the, the dark current would go higher, the photo current would come uh, lower, uh, and it won't have the same performance of this thing. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, I have a question that is about the device that you showed at the end. I mean, what's about the stability? I mean, when you bring it to the, to the beach, it is exposed to high temperature. So, uh, so in terms of... Sure. Uh, we actually tested it at different temperature. It, it is uh, very stable up to 50. However, the performance change based on the temperature. So the signal you receive from the device at let's say 25 degree will be different than if the temperature is 45. And that's how, that's why on the PCB, we already added uh, the temperature sensor and also the humidity sensor. And in the, uh, the, the, the app that we developed and the, the code that we wrote, we kind of calibrated based on this, the, the device can read what is the temperature and can kind of uh, calibrate the signal based on what the temperature is. A stability, is, uh, there is not a problem. It's just the signal will be different based on temperature, which can be easily uh, fixed. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I can jump in. Uh... Well, given the the um, the challenge in putting all these devices together, what are your predictions, for example, on cost? Is it something that somebody can uh, later afford, or is it going to be something that uh, will be restricted to the elite, those who can afford it? Sure, it's going to be very cheap. The, the, the sensor would cost us six dollars, and the when we designed the PCB initially, it was a little bit costly, but now. We manufacture it, so each PCB would cost uh, around ten to twelve dollars. So I'm expecting the device wouldn't be uh, more than twenty dollars. However, when you make it smaller and if you go for mass production, I think you can still make the cost uh, lower. And uh, the other thing about this technology is that if you already, if there is any company that already is uh, fabricating, uh, for example, a smartwatch or a, tech, uh, a smart technology. They don't even need to go through the problem of adding the battery and also using the PCB. All they need is to that tiny six dollar sensors to be embedded into an already developed wearable technology. Uh, we still have time. Two minutes for questions. Any other question? Yep. Jorgen. Uh, question. Um, how important is the angle orientation of a device to the sun? when you're wearing it on the body, you're moving constantly. 
Absolutely. It's very important. That's a challenge. We still haven't solved that problem. Like one of some of the ideas that we have is that we can have multiple sensors and we can kind of see which one is, uh, what is the direction, like when the end user is moving uh, their hand, if we assume that they're using it as a, as a, as a uh, hand wrist device. But this is the challenge we still have. Yes, absolutely. If you expose it uh, this direction or the other direction, you will end up with a different result. Yeah, and that's actually that one. Another challenge is the main challenge that dealing we are dealing because we patented this technology, but we haven't commercialized it yet because uh, because of this challenge. Yeah, but, but actually, uh, if I can just piggyback back on that, given that the census is affordable, uh, would it be possible for you to put multiple sensors on a single device so then okay. you can triangulate uh, which angle and orientation you have and compensate for it? Correct. Uh, this is actually what we are trying to do, multiple ones, but then we also have to make sure that but other, um, uh, in terms of direction, we can actually uh, see how the end user is using it. Uh, initially, we started with the, the hand, uh, like, the, like a watch, but we also have to think about if you go at, uh, further and you wanted to, for example, uh, uh, suggest this device to be a clippable device, then how we can actually challenge, uh, fix that challenge of uh, like, you know, the direction. Uh, but yeah, definitely uh, using multiple multiple sensors would, would uh, help us to uh, hopefully solve this problem. Uh, thank you very much. Very fascinating work. Thank you. Appreciate. Uh, our next speaker is Matt Jones from uh, Lice University. Matt, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, you can see my slides okay? Yep. Good. All right. So it's really my uh, pleasure and honor to be here today. And what I'll tell you about is some of the work that's been going on in my group over the past few years at Rice University, where we're really interested in building new materials where our fundamental building block isn't atoms like a traditional chemist, but nanoparticles. And the idea is that by using nanoparticle building blocks, we can construct some, some really beautiful new super lattice type materials. And since nanoparticles themselves have new properties, the idea is that the new material will inherit some of those properties and we can design structures to address to do this, we first have to be able to understand how these nanoparticles are synthesized individually. So what I'm showing you here is a summary of some of the nanoparticles that are synthesized in my lab. These are all made of gold. And you'll notice a few things here. So one is that we have really amazing control over the particle shape. So some of these are shapes you're familiar with, like a cube or an octahedron. Others get quite exotic, like a tetrahexahedron. But we can control the shape very easily. We can also synthesize these in such a way that they are very uniform in terms of their size. And that's very important for getting them to assemble into these large scale super lattice architectures. Now, the thing I'm not telling you is that in almost all of these cases, we have absolutely no idea mechanistically how these reactions work. So we really do not understand why one set of synthetic conditions gives me this particle shape and a nearly identical set of synthetic conditions gives me a completely different particle. And obviously this is a huge challenge if we want to be able to rationally design these kinds of architectures from these nanoparticle building blocks. And it is this challenge which animates some of the fundamental work that's going on in my lab, where we're trying to develop ways of understanding nanoparticle synthesis from a kind of deep chemical mechanistic perspective, rather than empirical trial and error, which has been the case in the past. So let me go into a little bit more depth into how these particles are synthesized. We're using a protocol that was developed more than 20 years ago called seed-mediated synthesis. This is by far the most common way that people synthesize nanoparticles. It's wildly successful. And the idea is simple. It just says, well, in order to synthesize a particle that has this unique shape, it might be difficult to do that in a reaction that's just one step or one pop. So let's just separate it into two steps. So the idea is in the first step, we're going to take some precursor. This is gold salt. We're going to reduce it in the presence of a molecule called a ligand. And we're going to make small particles we're going to call seeds. In a second set step, a second solution, we're going to have many of the same components, a weak reducing agent. And we're, the idea is we're going to bring that solution right up to the cusp of being able to homogeneously nucleate a particle, but not quite. Okay, so it's kinetically trapped. 
And it is to that solution that we add our seed particles. And the idea is that in introducing that new surface, heterogeneous nucleation is allowed to occur. It can occur in a slow and controlled manner, and we can dictate the formation of these well-defined particles. In doing this, there is a very uh, well-understood surface chemistry where halides, these Xs, are bound to the gold surface. And this positively charged surfactant coordinates those halides. And since this is done in water, there's necessarily a bilayer type structure. So this image will be important later in the talk. So just to reiterate, this is a wildly successful protocol. Everyone uses this and has been done for 20 years. And for that whole period of time, these seed particles have been described as three to five nanometer spherical particles. And the kind of amazing result that's, that I'm gonna share with you today is that we've identified that these seeds are in fact an atomically precise nano cluster. So let me be very clear about my distinction between cluster, nano cluster and nano particle. So what I'm showing you here is a graph of the energy of a particle as a function of the number of atoms that it has. So as we move up on this graph, we're getting to particles that are more stable. This dotted line represents a bulk crystal. And you can see that there are two distinct regimes in this plot, one in which this function just kind of smoothly asymptotes towards the bulk, where adding one atom or subtracting an atom really doesn't change the energy of the structure very much. And it's this regime that I'm calling nanoparticles. And over here, you can tell something energetically very, very different is happening in this system. And this is the cluster regime. So take this data point, for example, what this is saying is that let's say that's 20 atoms, there happens to be a very stable configuration geometrically of 20 atoms. But if I add an atom or if I subtract an atom, there is no good way to configure those. And what this means is that a synthesis targeted at particles of this size, anything larger than that particle is unstable, anything smaller than that particle is unstable. And this allows you to synthesize particles that are atomically perfect. Every single particle is exactly the same. Uh, and so this is really a completely different regime of nanoscience where we're not synthesizing particles anymore. These are, in fact, molecules. They are atomically perfect. And so I should mention that these structures are atomically well-defined with respect to the number of inorganic atoms in the core and with respect to the number of surface ligands. And so this observation from my group is that these seed particles are, in fact, these very special objects called nanoclusters. So let me tell you how I know that. I'm just reiterating the scheme for the synthesis of these. I'm just being a little bit more general in the name of the ligand I'm using. I'm calling it an alkyl quaternary ammonium halide. In the presence of that surface ligand and a gold salt, we reduce and we can generate these objects. Now, if I'm right that these are molecules, this means that some of the classical chemistry characterization tools we learned about ought to be applicable, including mass spec. So if this is a molecule and I run mass spec, I ought to see one peak indicating the presence of a large molecule. And that's, in fact, what I find when we do MALDI mass spec. Okay, now we synthesized this cluster with a ligand shown here. And we did the synthesis again, but all we did was just add a few carbon atoms at the end of that chain. And we can see the mass of the overall cluster increases dramatically. We can do this, uh, uh, I should note that the cluster synthesized with this ligand and this ligand, we can show are spectroscopically identical. So we think this means that the inorganic core is the same and all that's changed is the surface ligands. Okay, so we can play this trick again. Let's add a few carbons at the end of the chain. We see that the overall mass increases, you do it again. And what you begin to realize is that since you can measure the difference in overall mass of the whole cluster, and you know exactly the increased mass that you're adding by just adding a few carbon atoms, you can back calculate exactly how many ligands there are per cluster. And you can do the same trick with the halide as well. And so you can use this strategy to identify the molecular formula of this object. And so we just kind of threw the kitchen sink at this. We went and bought every single kind of alkyl quaternary ammonium halide ligand we could, and we synthesized clusters and they are all came out spectroscopically ident identical with all these different ligands. And using this calculation technique, we can identify the molecular formula of this <clears throat> seed, and that's shown here. 
So we've identified that it is a 32 gold atom core. There are eight halides that are negatively charged and bound to that particle. And then there are 12 ligands that are this very interesting electrostatic bound ion pair. So we have a halide that's bound to the surface and the positively charged surfactant that's electrostatically coordinated to it. And that constitutes one neutral ligand. So I just want to take a step and highlight how incredible this is. This means that for 20 years, people have been synthesizing this and using it as a precursor in all of these nanoparticle syntheses without ever knowing it. So we wanted to do some work to corroborate that finding from the mass spec, and we do a lot of TEM in my group. So what I'm showing you here is a cryo TEM image. So we've taken that cluster and we flash frozen it, and then we've gone and done TEM on it. And you can notice a couple things. First of all, there are no objects that are three to five nanometers in size, which is what had been claimed in the past. In addition, there are many of these particles that are very small, on the order of one nanometer, which is what you would expect for a particle that's only 32 atoms. Uh, now, unfortunately, we were not able to get atomic structure. We cannot reconstruct the structure of the cluster from these cryo images, but we could deposit our clusters on a sheet of graphene. And those images are shown here, and you can tell that we're, we're now achieving atomic resolution images of these very, very small particles. Now, un again, unfortunately, uh, as many groups have seen in the past, Imaging small particles like this creates many perturbations and damage to the particle, and that's shown here. So these things are moving around. There's all kinds of dynamics here. This makes it impossible to reconstruct the structure of the cluster from these images. However, we can actually take advantage of this fact uh, in order to count the number of atoms per cluster. So all we've done, all we do is just write a very simple image processing algorithm that identifies the centroid of these atoms and count how many there are, and then do that process over again as the particle rotates. So it's doing the work for us. It's presenting multiple different orientations. And so we can just count how many atoms there are per cluster, average that over the rotation of the particle. And what we get are numbers that corroborate exactly what we found in our mass spec, that there's something like 32 gold atoms per cluster. So we think this is really nice uh, evidence that our mass spec assignment is correct. Now, unfortunately, none of this tells us about the structure of the cluster, right? We still don't know exactly what uh, its three-dimensional structure is. But interestingly, in 2019, two different groups in back-to-back -back issues, the back-to-back -back papers in Angamante Chemie published the first crystal structures of a gold 32 cluster. Now, these are, these are those crystal structure data. Now, these clusters have completely different ligands from what we've identified, and they're not soluble in water, but they both agree in many, many respects to the assignment that we have come to from our mass spec data. So they both report a 32-atom uh, gold cluster that has pseudo-icosahedral symmetry. They both report 20 total binding sites for the ligands, eight of one type and 12 of another resulting in an A-plus charge in the core. And these are exactly the same features that we identified from our mass spec data. So we think it is it would be an amazing coincidence if we didn't have exactly the same kind of structure that these groups have identified separately. And to corroborate that, we collaborated with two different theory groups, uh, one that does molecular dynamic simulations where uh, MD was used to capture the structure of the flexible alkyl ligands on the surface of the cluster. And then once equilibrated, those ligands were truncated just to ammonia. And then that was used for inputs in a DFT simulation in order to predict the absorption spectrum of the cluster. And that's shown here. So in black, you're seeing the theoretical absorption spectrum from this work. And in blue and green, you're looking at our experimental data. And you can see that they match very nicely in many of the same kind of fundamental electronic transitions. And so we think this is excellent evidence that we indeed have this pseudo icosahedral hollow structure to our gold cluster that has been used again for 20 years and now we're the first to identify it. Um, you may be thinking, well, okay, you can show that this cluster is present in the solution. How do you know it's not just a spectator? How do you know it's playing some important role? 
So what I'm showing you here are two different syntheses for gold nanorods that have been seeded either with particles following the traditional uh, synthesis or with a solution of our gold 32 clusters of very high concentration. And you can see qualitatively that the particles look of higher quality, but we can quantify this. We developed an image processing algorithm that looked at you know, something like 20,000 different nanorods. And here you can see that the yield of the rod-shaped products is higher when you use gold 32, and the yield of the impurities is lower. And then what I'm showing here is the major axis versus minor axis of the resultant nanorods. This blue ellipse is the 95% confidence interval. It's tighter for the gold 32 seeded particles, meaning they're more uniform. So the role that this is playing is still not completely clear, but what we can say is that it is playing a mechanistic role because increasing its concentration results in particles that are more pure and more uniform than available before. And the final thing I wanna show is just that these data don't exist in a vacuum. We've actually used the insights that we gained from this kind of atomic molecular precursor to synthesize tetrahedron shaped particles of higher purity and uniformity than what was ever available before. And kind of amazingly, these just spontaneously assemble themselves into super lattices shown here, which are chiral. And chiral materials at this length scale made of plasmonic metals like gold and silver are very interesting in terms of their optical properties. So we're really excited about the kind of opportunities for building new materials from nanoparticle building blocks using these insights. And this is just a larger scale image of that same kind of super lattice. So just to conclude, I've shown you that probably many of these syntheses are seeded by some kind of nanocluster molecule. It may not always be gold 32, but something of that general structure. There are still many mysteries in nanoparticle synthesis. One major one is how symmetry breaking occurs to synthesize particles whose symmetry does not match their underlying crystal structure. And using these insights, we can build new materials that have interesting chiral optical properties. So with that, let me thank uh, my group, the members that participated in this work, collaborators, the funding agencies, and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you much. Um, yeah, to the speakers, when you see me raise my hand on the screen, it means you have one minute. Uh, questions? Any question, for, yeah, Max? Yes, uh, uh, very interesting uh, chiral structures. Uh, just curious for those super lattices, what are some of the uh, uh, unique properties and the potential uses of them? Right, so um, the field of metamaterials looks at uh, structured, uh, uh, materials that have structures at the nanoscale that generate new optical properties. For example, a negative index of refraction. So this is a very exciting field. And one of the most appealing ways to generate structures that have these properties uh, is to have chirality at this length scale. So we're working with collaborators to do measurements. These have circular dichroism essentially at optical wavelengths. And so this is a route towards materials that have, that can manipulate light in very strange and interesting ways. So that's kind of the, the future direction of these structures is to understand their optical properties and use them to build metamaterials. Thanks. So another quick follow-up question is how does the performance compare with those uh, artificially designed and fabricated uh, uh, super lattices and uh, uh, metamaterials? Yeah, so we still have a lot of work to do in terms of these measurements, but most uh, artificially designed metamaterials are generated through lithography. And generally, these lithographically defined materials have polycrystalline uh, you know, metals that have been evaporated. All of our particles are single crystalline. The spacing between our particles is on the order of a few nanometers, which is very challenging to achieve lithographically. And we can also scale up the synthesis of this material because it's self-assembled. So we could generate a structure of this type that was the size of my desk with ease. And that would be, again, very difficult to do lithographically. So there are a lot of advantages to generating something like this through self-assembly rather than lithography. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jürgen? Yeah, two quick questions. Um, 
How about the stability over time once they're synthesized? Uh, how you stabilize them that you can store them, you know, and a month later they're still what you expected? And how you expand to other materials than gold? Mm -hmm. So stability, these, these clusters are not very stable. And that is in fact exactly what you would expect if in fact they had they were acting as this precursor seed. They ought to be very reactive. If they couldn't react with anything, they wouldn't be a heterogeneous nucleation site for growth. <clears throat> we have ways of decorating them with new ligands that protect them, and they can be stable for six months after we do that. Um, other materials, there are there's a host of literature on silver and copper now, clusters that have these same kind of features. They have these magic number sizes and they're decorated by ligands. And so I don't see there being any reason why fundamentally these other materials shouldn't show the same kind of phenomena. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Any other question? All right. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, we move to the next person. Our next speaker is uh, Babak. Please share your slides. The floor is yours. All right. <clears throat> thank you so much. My slides are clear. Yes. I assume yes. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for the, the committee for uh, selecting me as, as one of the finalists for the Young Scientists Award. Today, I'm going to talk about the use of 2D vaccines for a unique application that my lab is pursuing for aerospace application. Now, the way I'm going to talk about today is first, I'm going to um, briefly explain uh, my contribution to the field of vaccines and then explain why aerospace applications and then my research group progress in this area. So first, uh, with, with Maxine, so as we all know that the large family of 2D materials, Maxine is, is one of the, the many 2D materials, and they're essentially transition metal carbides and nitrides, where we have all these early transition metals with uh, carbon and nitrogen in between them, and they all have surface termination on them. And their synthesis is not a growth mechanism, which is important when we are targeting large scale applications such as aerospace. So the synthesis of vaccine is a top down method, which comes by selective etching of certain layers of atoms from their precursor. Um, and, and when we go from these layer structure to exfoliated 2D that they are bonded uh, and then separate these such as these single Lake in TEM, and we can make them into larger scale colloidal solution. Now, since their discovery in 2011, Maxine have been exploring a variety of different applications, uh, including energy, catalysis, electronics, optical applications, and more recently, biomedical, environmental application, and electromagnetic interference shielding, and others. And the reason for this rapid expansion in different application is the large compositional space of Maxine. That we can have single element Maxine with different transition metals, or we can have a salt solution of transition metals, which I mark here with green. And then we can have unique ordered structures that they are not possible to make in bulk. And here's one of my contribution to the field of Maxine, the ordered atomic sandwiches of transition metals that um, um, basically we discovered in 2015 during my postdoc time at Drexel University, and they're all marked with red. And more recently, my labs um, put out the high entropy vaccine 2021, which is now combining the concept of high entropy and 2D, we put the first high entropy vaccine where we have four different transition metals within the 2D flake. And by doing that, we can have more tunability to the compositional space. And since then, which was last year, now there are five different high entropy. And these are not only from my research group, these are all coming from around the world that the high entropy field of vaccine is growing. Now, this is basically a quick intro about Maxine and, and the composition. The vision of my research group is basically the discovery, design and discovery of, of novel nanomaterials, which is the focus is on, on Maxine's and fundamental understanding of uh, their electronic structure, 
larger scale production and use them for clean environment, more on electric catalysis. Now, the part that I want to focus today, which is the most ambitious of all of these, and I, I really uh, am really excited about, is the use of Maxine in aerospace, something that so far has not been really explored, and, and that's something that my research group is, is exploring in the past three years. Now, why aerospace? Let me explain to you why, in my opinion, that is important. So we all know that, for example, in we have electronics, energy, and space. If you look at all these, which one, in, in, in uh, my opinion, have been overlooked? So for energy and electronics, we know that in the past 50 years, we've made a lot of progress. We went from these computers that they wouldn't really do much to are basically supercomputers of 50 years ago in our pockets that they can last for days without even plugging in. How about space? Well, if I show you this image and I ask you, do you think this is from 1970 or 2022? It's hard to tell because as we all know, we had the first um, moon mission after many years uh, a few weeks ago. And in fact, this image is from 1969, the first Apollo mission. And now after 50 years, we are restarting this. So we had a stop, we had a halt on this. And in terms of materials design of aerospace, we haven't made that much progress. We are using the same materials of, of 50 years ago. The same materials. Imagine if we were using the same computers of 50 years ago, we wouldn't have this conversation because we couldn't run a Zoom or, or other software. The, the, we have made a lot of progress in aerospace, without a doubt. For example, the control room has changed a lot. But in terms of materials design, not much. Here's another one, more for passenger airliners. If I show you this image, and this is a supersonic flight, and I ask you whether it is from 1970 or 2022, this is from 1976 Concorde supersonic airliner. And what do we have to, in 2022? We don't have this. So we went back. Imagine if I give you your computer in the year 2000 and say, you're going to use this one and not no more progress. Yes, there were a lot of environmental issues on, on Concorde supersonic airliners. But we should not stop. If because of environmental issue, we would stop making progress in electronics, we wouldn't be here. So my goal is to look at fundamental research to design novel materials for aircraft and spacecraft. The way usually I say is aircrafts are not made of air. They're made of material. So we need materials novelty here. Now, one type of materials being used for aerospace is ultra high temperature ceramics. They are ceramics that they have melting temperatures above 3000 degrees Celsius, and their oxides also have a high melting temperature. And they are transition metal carmides, nitrides, and borides, similar chemistry to maxines that can be used for hypersonic flights, that they can go as fast as five times Mach 5, five times of speed of sound that can make the travel, air travel a lot faster and make our ambitious goal for space possible. So now what does these do anything to do with, with Maxine's? So Maxine's, as I mentioned, this is the composition of Maxine. And what I like to do with, with my group and my students is we always go back to in the literature and find how we can relate our current knowledge what has been done many years ago. So these are not about 2D. These are the phase uh, diagrams of transition metal carbides and nitrides. And we can see that the same composition of maxines are stable at very low temperature. And these are order vacancy, where we have carbon vacancy being ordered within these structures. To make these, because they are low temperature, for example, for titanium carbon phase diagram, they are only 700 degrees Celsius. They, we need to anneal them for days to make this structure possible. Or we have the same thing for tantalum. So now by using Maxine, we have a tool. We have a tool that is scalable. We can make these in, in form of films or spray, something that is impossible to spray high temperature ceramics on any surfaces without any additive. We have this additive 
scalable nanomaterials that can be used to make films, then they can transform to ultra high temperature ceramics. So this is the unique tool, but you might ask, so why you're proposing to make a bulk carbide to, to go to 2D and then turn that to bulk? That is exactly what we want to do. Why? Because by doing so, now we have atomically precise tools to design our bulk high temperature materials, something that is impossible with all the traditional synthesis method. And by controlling defects at the atomic level, we can make the perfect imperfect structure by defects, for example, carbon vacancy. And because of the scalability, we can manufacture materials with additive manufacturing. Now, how do we do it in, 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 in my lab? So we have this flakes of 2Ds of Maxine that we can put them together. So these are carbides. And we can, we can select the single uh, flakes of 2D. They are one nanometer thick and put them together to make a film. Or we can even go with the particles, exfoliated particles. The tools that we are using, obviously, we need high temperature furnaces. We also have in situ hot stage, uh, which is right now the focus of one of my PhD students, Brian Wyatt. And the way we do, we have these Maxine films. They're all carmite films that we anneal them in situ in XRD and step by step detect the phase transformation. Now, how do we do the phase transformation? So if you look at here, I want to just have your attention to the first, the bottom of this slide. So we have here the Maxine X-ray diffraction pattern. By annealing them to 1000 C, we see that the, um, these peaks of Maxine disappear and peaks of titanium carmine appear. Now, for two of these, usually it is always known or, or thought that all of these will transform to oxides. But we are showing that, no, indeed, they are stable as carmides, which is so important for all these aerospace applications. How do we have this phase transformation? So we have the basal plane of a hexagonal 00L peak of um, maxines. And by increasing the temperature, they transform to bulk titanium carmide, the rock salt uh, FCC structure. And we see the 111 plane. We know that the 111 plane and the 001 plane of HCP versus FCC, they are equivalent in terms of arrangement of atoms. So we are forming these 111. Now, when we look at the XRD of, of 1500 anneal, we see that we have these 111 and 222 peaks being the dominant, confirming that we are growing these basically on the 111 plane of ball. So we have a tool to control the morphology. So what really happening here is by increasing the temperature, first we remove whatever is absorbed between the layers, then we remove the surface termination, and we start seeing homoepitaxial growth, something that has been even reported before uh, in 2019 of, of these carbides over itself. And then by increasing the higher temperature, we can transform to bulk. So what now we're doing, which is even more ambitious, is using one of these um, ordered phases that um, basically my contribution to the field of vaccines and see what happens to them because they are not really stable in bulk form. So by increasing the temperature, we confirm that even for these exotic vaccines, we can transform them to bulk carmides in a way that is not possible traditionally. And here's SDM images confirming our hypothesis that is happening in at the atomic level. So we're looking at top plane of the Maxine film. And by increasing the temperature to 900 C, we see formation of carbides at the atomic level. So they're basically, there's no other additive. It's homoepitaxial growth. And this is basically explaining what happens very similar to TI3C2. Maxine that we have basically removal of molybdenum from its bulk, uh, from the 2D carmide, and formation of growth on, on the planes of Maxine's, the homoepitaxial growth happening even for the more exotic Maxine of molybdenum 2TI. And here's showing beyond just single 
lake, we can do the same thing in a thicker films of Maxine's, opening a possibility of making high temperature materials from this nano 2D flakes in a scalable way. So basically to conclude my presentation, we have a large compositional space of Maxine's that, uh, and when we have possibility of, of ordered phases that is not traditionally possible. And more recently, we have the high entropy Maxine's that we put out. And now by increasing the temperature, we are not changing them to oxides. What we do, remove the surface termination, remove the adsorbed species from the surface of Maxine and turn them to bulk in a way that it is impossible to make or uh, from traditional. Now, because of these 2D species, we can even wrap them around the grains of bulk ceramic, something I did not present today because of time. But by doing so, we can control the growth. We can control the synthesis manufacturing of high temperature materials and open new way of, of novelty in an area that has been overlooked in my opinion, in the past 50 years and bring back the possibilities that we had 20 years ago. So with that, I would like to thank my uh, brilliant students uh, and also the funding agencies that are supporting this ambitious project. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, may I start? Thank you. Thank you. Yep, go ahead. Uh, Okay, beautiful stuff. But uh, so, what you've shown that you get very high thermal stability. But besides that, what kind of properties are you looking for for the aerospace application? Because I think that has been sure. not very clear. So, yes, um, I, I just mentioned the phase transformation. So, one thing, um, there are a few um, basically areas. One is known for all the aerospace, uh, the high temperature ceramics, or in general, ceramics. They don't have fracture toughness. They're very brittle. So by wrapping the grains with Maxines, we can control, we can basically do grain boundary engineering by adding the same composition so we can improve the fracture toughness as one thing. Now, by going from bulk, from layer to bulk, we can also tune the, the layers. We can, uh, the other area that we are focusing on is what we can put in between the layers to control even the, the thermal properties, something that is impossible from the traditional when we do just a bulk sintering. So it's the thermal properties, as well as improving the fracture toughness and also design uh, compositions for even higher stability and higher temperature stability. So these three areas. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, maybe uh, uh, to, to join in, um, because I don't think the Concorde was taken out of uh, commission because of material design issues, operating cost, I think, was the issue. Uh, so maybe they did not change the materials for so many years because what they already have uh, and what is currently being used apparently is already very, very good. So what are the benchmarks? What do you need to, to reach? How much do you need to improve the materials and which factors uh, actually do you need to improve for the aerospace the industry to buy your materials and replace uh, whatever they're using? Can you yes. put some numbers? So, in? Yes. Um, first, um, this, this project is only um, the whole uh, materials of Maxine for this is only three years. And I've been lucky to convince the uh, funding agencies to work on this. Um, so now going back to Concord, I believe in terms of materials design, we do need novelty, in fact, because if I would have said, well, in 20 years ago, our computers in 2000 is as great. Why should we uh, do more uh, novelty? I think everyone here would disagree. The same thing for, for Concord. One main problem here uh, that Concord or any supersonic is fuel consumption. So if you use the traditional method, it's so difficult to come up with materials that will not require higher fuel consumption. So uh, for example, we are, uh, there are a lot of uh, industry that they are claiming that in 2029, they're putting back supersonic or hypersonic airliners. 
and they're using uh, carbon fibers or novel uh, nano uh, fibers in their design. Also in their engines, something I did not cover which area, in the engines also, the engines of, of these um, airplanes require different design. And if you use the traditional materials, it is impossible. Now by using nanomaterials, we have basically, we can, we can come up with first compositions that they're impossible to make and design lighter material that require less fuel consumption. Now, in terms of um, selling them to airliners, we are at the final fundamental stage. So it is too soon to, to take it to the commercial application at the moment. Okay. Right, uh, Mabak, I have a quick question. Chris, are you done? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I think coming back to the material question, as, as you just mentioned, that we have moved away from the over in titanium that was used to make the Concorde and the earlier aircrafts. Because the Dreamliner is a, uh, is a fast uh, plastic air, aircraft. Uh, so we are in the plastic age in that space. So there has been uh, some material advances. Um, we are not in the 70s. And then with the advance towards uh, plastics, how do you see your material interface in that? Because then the surface energy mismatch is so huge that even with very good uh, carbide um, materials, how are they going to put it on the composite that they're using right now to make the, 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 the A380 and the Dreamliner? Sure. So uh, first, I want to make sure it is clear. I'm not saying that we haven't made any progress since the 1970s. Uh, what I'm saying is we need more novelty. So obviously we have made a lot of progress in the design, but we need, we can have more novelty in the design. So um, yes, these are carmides, but the unique thing is we know there are a body of literature on vaccines with polymers and they have a strong bonding because of their surface functionality. We can have strong bonding between these 2D flakes and the, the polymers on, on this. There are a lot of even polymer composite on vaccines. So by now combining the polymer composites and this idea of phase transformation, then we can have basically a, a connection and the bonding layer between the two sides, the high temperature carbides and the plastics by combining now the Maxine plastic. So we have the smooth transition and all of these will happen in uh, the limited space. So just few nanometers. So that's the other advantage of using Maxines because we can tune the surface something that it is impossible when you're just spraying carbides. That's not possible for carbides. Thank you very much for the interest of time. Let's uh, jump to our next speaker, uh, Jonathan. And then I would like to request that after Jonathan's talk, we take a few minutes uh, uh, biology break, and then we resume uh, um, right after the questions on Jonathan's talk. Jonathan, take us away. All right. <clears throat> So thank you very much for uh, the opportunity. Uh, today I'm going to share to you uh, some of the work that we've been doing in my lab at Northwestern uh, on uh, polymers, on soft mixed conductors uh, for applications in bioelectronics. Now the area that my group is most interested in is, is indeed bioelectronics. And the big challenge here is coupling the world of biology uh, with that of electronics. And so there's a number of aspects that make this a really challenging interface. Uh, so in biology, we're often dealing with soft systems. Uh, we're dealing with dynamic systems that are constantly moving, they're evolving, uh, their they're, cells are dividing, uh, and communication occurs by uh, ions and, and biomolecular recognition. Whereas in microelectronics, we're often talking about relatively hard materials uh, that are considered static usually, and the communication occurs by uh, transport of electrons and holes. Now, there's a number of ways to bridge uh, this interface, and a lot of the work that's been done I believe in some of the, the exciting bioelectronics work recently focuses on ultra thin structures on deterministic architectures uh, that allow for uh, uh, traditional thin film electronics to conform on organs or on the skin, things like that. The approach that my uh, team is very interested in is actually bridging this interface with a class of materials that we call organic mixed conductors, organic mixed ionic electronic conductors. So why are these materials so interesting for this application and what are they? So in this case, uh, you can see that I've shown a number of examples here. They have this conjugated polymer backbone, which we borrow a lot of uh, uh, what we know about 
materials from the field, the broader field of organic electronics, but generally they either have some sort of charged uh, po polymer electrolyte, uh, a polyelectrolyte, or they have these tethered ionic groups or side chains that allow for ions to be solvated. And it gives you this kind of structure uh, with relatively uh, weak van der Waal bonding interactions that allow for ions uh, in their hydrated state uh, to enter and interact with the charged species on the backbone. So indeed, you have a number of interesting uh, uh, outcomes and, and exciting opportunities from these materials. Uh, the obvious one is the ability to transport electronic carriers for bioelectronics, uh, the tunability of synthetic properties um, uh, and, and processing to control uh, properties, um, low temperature processing, of course, and the ability to process from a number of different um, uh, techniques. And these last three are, are what I believe are the most interesting for applications in bioelectronics. One is, of course, they have mechanical properties that can be very close to bio, very closely matched to biosystems, even made uh, a, almost in a hydrogel-like form factor if needed. They have high ionic mobilities, and we can use the coupling of electronic excitations to affect uh, properties. This can be used from electrochromism to actuation to sensing. <clears throat> so one of the exciting aspects of these materials is that uh, we can achieve uh, different form factors. Right? We can achieve everything from fibrous meshes and scaffolds to printable uh, millimeter and uh, <clears throat> micrometer and millimeter scale constructs uh, to, of course, enabling uh, materials with uh, th these very flexible and conformable form factors for thin film electronics. Now, to me, I think this ability to achieve interesting form factors uh, is, is one of the motivating factors. Uh, but one of the reasons that we like to uh, work with these materials is that their electrochemical and electrical properties are actually quite exciting for interfacing with biological system. They have this volumetric response, uh, basically this volumetric charging uh, that has been used in polymer batteries and pseudocapacitors. And what does that mean? That means if you take a material such as P.PSS, which I showed here, and you measure its electrochemical impedance uh, spectroscopy, you can extract the capacitance as a function of uh, the geometric size of this piece of material. And what you find is that this scales linearly, you can see here over three orders of magnitude or more, uh, with the volume of the material. And so you have this volumetric capacitance for P.PSS about 40 farads per centimeter cubed. So what does this mean? If we're thinking about a flat ion impenetrable uh, material, like a metal electrode, you're going to have uh, your capacitance dominated by the electro, the um, electrochemical, the electrical double layer. Whereas in a polymer, because of this ability of ions to enter the bulk uh, and and uh, have this volumetric capacitance, you can have a situation where, for a relatively thin film on the order of about 130 nanometers, you can have an effective capacitance per unit area of 500 microfarads per centimeter squared. Right? This is a hundredfold larger than the double layer capacitance. And in bioelectronics, this has led to really interesting and exciting uh, progress. Essentially, this high effective capacitance lowers the uh, impedance across that biotic abiotic interface, which allows for higher signal to noise ratio recordings and higher current injection limit. So electrodes are interesting. Um, in, in my uh, experience, in my time during my postdoc, for example, I got really excited about looking at transistors for bioelectronics. And the use of transistors in bioelectronics is not a new one. It's actually a really exciting tool that's been used for quite some time. And the reason it's interesting is because transistors are really efficient switches. Right? A small change in an input, like in a gate electrode, could lead to a, a large change at the output. In this case, it would be the current between the source and the drain. And there's been a number of approaches to use electrolyte gated transistors, either with or without a dielectric, to perform this kind of transaction. But what if we can now use the volumetric charging of these materials uh, to make these transistors? This is something that had been demonstrated uh, in concept back in the 1980s and has really picked up in the last five or so years, uh, and it's called the organic electrochemical transistor. Now, it's useful for a number of different applications. You can use it as a single uh, transistor transducer of electrophysiological signals, uh, tissue or, uh, or cell layer or lipid layer impedance or biochemical sensors. And of course, it opens up the opportunity to use these as uh, uh, circuit elements for analog circuits, digital circuits, or even neuromorphic uh, devices that mimic uh, the function of the brain. 
So one of the things we did is, uh, you know, moving away from materials like PDOT is to actually use what we know about uh, high performing backbones in organic electronics. And in this case, we worked with collaborators, uh, our collaborator Ian McCulloch at, uh, at KAUST at the time uh, to uh, take a common backbone, this is this thiophene based backbone, and replace the side chains with ethylene glycol uh, uh, oligomers. And we put this into the channel of a transistor. And right away, for those of you who are familiar with transistor um, uh, IV characteristics, uh, it looks something like this. It looks quite similar to what you'd expect from a field effect transistor. So here you see an output curve. Right? That's the uh, uh, drain current as a function of that uh, drain voltage, uh, as well as uh, transfer curves here. This is now as a function of gate voltage. Uh, and you see very typical low hysteresis type response. One of the metrics that we often quote is the transconductance. That's the slope here of this transfer curve. It tells you how large of a change in current you can get for a small change in your gate voltage. Now, by scaling to different device dimensions, we can look at essentially the, 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 the device physics of these types of uh, materials. And we find that the scaling of the transconductance looks a lot like a field effect transistor, except that you've now decoupled that capacitance per unit area into a thickness term, you see here D, and that volumetric capacitance. And now we can just start to use this to engineer our devices. We know that geometry can be a useful term. We know that, uh, of course, bias as a scaling relationship. And we have this materials term, this electronic carrier mobility multiplied by that volumetric capacitance, which can be used not only to engineer materials, but to benchmark and to better understand why some materials are better than others. So one of the things we do in my group is uh, uh, try to establish some structure property relations. Um, and one of the challenges with a material like this where solvent and ions can get into the bulk of the material is that structure can vary drastically upon exposure and operation right, to solvent, ions, and bias. And this makes it really challenging to study. It means that we need to develop new tools. And so one of the things that we've done over the past uh, few years is to really introduce a suite of uh, setups that allow us to monitor the structure of these materials while they're operating. So for example, here you see X-ray scattering or X-ray scattering and diffraction um, of uh, some of these materials in different conditions, exposed to electrolyte, uh, doped or de-doped, oxidized or reduced. Uh, but you can even have movies like this where you see 2D grazing incidence patterns where you're cycling the material uh, using cyclic voltammetry and you can see shifts in the various uh, stacking directions of the crystalline portions of the film. So I won't have time to talk too much about um, uh, these fundamental efforts, uh, but I do want to make the point that what this has allowed is for a really large library of materials to be developed. Right? So both from uh, materials that are being developed for bioelectronics applications, but also ones that are being repurposed from other applications. And we've even extended this in recent years uh, to look at small molecules, working with collaborators at Queen Mary, Christian Nielsen, as well as looking at newer materials, such as these uh, framework materials, these uh, covalent organic frameworks that give us these um, highly controlled porosities that might be really interesting for sensing and devices working with Will Dictel here at Northwestern. All right, so I'm talking to you here about materials, some of their fundamentals, and how they might be interesting for devices. But for the last bit of this talk, I want to highlight one of the aspects that's often overlooked. At the end of the day, you can make these beautiful devices based on materials, but you, got, you have to do something with that information, right? You have to uh, have some sort of intermediate signal processing. For example, in neuroscience, maybe a head stage on a rat that does some preamplification, some multiplexing, thresholding, and then you have a back end as well. So one of the aspects that's really been motivating my group is actually bringing some of that higher function from the back end uh, into the front end. Right, so basically making these uh, front-end devices a little bit smarter. So what's one, one, one example of that? And I'll give you uh, one brief example here, and that's potentially bringing amplification right to that biotic-abiotic interface. And one way to do, to do that is to turn to the fundamental building block of, uh, of digital logic, and that's the complementary inverter. This is basically a simple two-transistor circuit. What it does is that the input it has a high output voltage, and at the uh, high uh, input range, it has a low output voltage with a transition region in the middle. So if you want to actually amplify a small signal, sitting right at this transition re re region, uh, it can be quite, quite exciting because a small change in that input voltage that you want to sense gives you a large change in that output voltage. So it's really a voltage-to-voltage -voltage amplifier. Now, one of the challenges here is you can 
you can make this a planar structure. You often need a, both a, a hole and an electron transporting uh, transistor, and that can take space and, and materials development. We wanted to see if we can use electrochemical transistors to solve this problem and co-localize this for on-site signal amplification. So my student, Reem Rashid, came up with this interesting idea to make a multi-layer stack of contacts and insulators and essentially ablate away this channel region here, either with photolithography or with laser processing such that you get two transistors on cofacial walls of this design. Right? This essentially gives you two transistors that you can wire up as a complementary inverter. And it looks like you can fold it up, uh, the circuit diagram, to essentially have uh, an inverter that takes up the space of a single passive recording electrode. So this can be on the size scale of about 10 to 30 microns. Of course, we can't pattern two different materials very easily here. So we turn to a material that we also had in our library from our synthetic collaborators. That's this uh, NDI, this naphthalene diamide bithiophene backbone with the glycolated side chains. It has balanced ambipolar performance. And by doing that, we can actually get these voltage transfer curves with gains, peak gains uh, of almost 30 fold. So this is really exciting. This means that on site, right at the, at the area you wanna record a electrophysiological signal, you can amplify that signal 30 fold before doing anything with it, right? So you can still have other uh, processing steps, but this is right at that biotic abiotic inter uh, uh, interface. We on the bench top validated that we can indeed use the output of this inverter pair to measure um, uh, ECG signals uh, that indeed matched uh, what we were getting from uh, digital multimeters. And we've now, we're now pushing uh, to do these measurements uh, with um, uh, uh, smaller signals now. Uh, looking at EEG signals, which is what we're we're actively pursuing. Now, other groups. This is interesting work from from uh, the uh, group in Sweden, uh, Simona Fabiano. You can make printed inverters based on electrochemical transistors, and we were uh, excited to see that they were getting similar performances to us. And indeed, um, it's quite interesting uh, because in this case, you have electrochemical transistors on the millimeter scale with a single stage inverter on the centimeter scale, of course, challenging for bioelectronics. Now, of course, this can be scaled down more or less, uh, but the exciting part about our technology is that we can make micron scale OECTs with a single stage inverter on that 10 to 30 micron scale, which is very interesting for high density bioelectronic mapping. The last point I wanna make is by using the advantages of, of, of this bulk transport that gives us the ability to process these materials in different, way, different ways, We've recently worked with Antonio Facchetti and, uh, and uh, uh, Tobin Marx's group, where they've developed an interesting material system and a way to process multiple materials on top of each other uh, to essentially now take this concept into an entirely vertical uh, complementary inverter structure. Uh, and we've been able to now see that this can uh, give us uh, inverter gains up to 150. So we're really pushing on this technology. And you can see this uh, potentially uh, moving forward towards um, uh, uh, also using it for neuromorphic devices and for uh, direct uh, sensors that can amplify. So I want to wrap it up here. Um, I think the use of organic mixed conductors will usher uh, really exciting non-traditional form factors. It allows for ease of fabrication requirements, and it will seamlessly, I believe, uh, help to bring the back end uh, to the biotic abiotic interfacing uh, interface. And so this includes inter integration of uh, uh, devices and front end with sensing, uh, Front end sensing with amplification, with signal processing, potentially even power generation and decision making. And for that, I'm, I'm, I'm talking more about uh, neuromorphic architectures that can be easily integrated into uh, with such materials. And this will lead to more efficient, integrated, and multimodal bioelectronics and robotics, uh, potentially even uh, bringing in new concepts from synthetic biology uh, and even regenerative engine and, and applications in regenerative engineering. Uh, so, with that, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, group that did all this hard work, and of course, the funding sources and collaborators. Uh, and I will uh, thank you for your time and be happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you very much. Questions from the panel? Maybe I can jump. Yeah, I can oh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I think we started at the same time. Well, yeah. thank you for an excellent contribution. and. Uh, nice developments you, you were sharing with us. Um, I think the Achilles heel of, of organic uh, electronics or the use of organic materials for electronics applications, yeah, is still stability. And when molecules get oxidized, reduced, they tend to become uh, yeah, reactive. Um, 
Do you have any issues with that? How stable are your devices? Uh, especially since you seem to be so close at, at applications, what, what would their, uh, then especially their, their long-term stability, uh, especially during operation? Yeah, that's a great question. That's an active area that we're working in. Um, I think the challenge here is that, of course, the needs for stability depend on your application. But that being said, um, I think there's a lot of hope uh, in, in the upcoming class of materials that really make this um, an exciting time, especially for organic mixed conductors. One of the reasons I say that is because we're starting to understand some of the mechanisms of degradation. I think previously people were focusing just on on energy levels and, and, and uh, uh, potential interactions with reactive oxygen species in water, which I think we have a pretty good handle on. But what we're finding now is that there's a lot of other aspects that contribute to the stability, things like the swelling of this active material, right? Because it does take up ions, um, delamination and, and, and other things like that. And so my group has been uh, tackling issues of swelling. Uh, we've been looking at uh, aspects where indeed it happens that the uh, contact material that you use um, uh, can actually facilitate uh, or have electrocatalysis happen, facilitate some of these uh, um, negative reactions that affect the material. But we're finding new ways to passivate those materials and to work with chemists to develop new materials. So I think there's a lot of promise um, and excitement going forward. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Uh, actually, uh, if I could piggyback on what Chris is asking, you mentioned about trying to develop means to passivate the materials. How do you do that on an organic surface uh, when you're working in a, in a medium that if you're in biological system, everything is organic and water? How do you do right. that? Right. Great question. I actually don't mean passivating the actual mixed conductor because uh, mm -hmm. indeed that's the mechanism of operation, as you mentioned. The passivation I was mentioning is in some cases you can have um, uh, um, formation of um, reactive species at the buried contacts, again, because now you have water and ions reaching that buried contact. And by either changing that contact material or putting on uh, self-assembled monolayers, you can still get su sufficient um, charge injection without having those negative reactions. And, and I will say that, you know, some of the newer materials, the more rigid backbones, uh, BBL, for example, uh, it's been shown that you can pulse this for, um, for, for days, right? For, uh, you know, accelerated aging type setups, and they're still uh, performing very highly. So um, th there is a, a route forward, I believe. Very, very good. Uh, any other question before we take a quick break? We are right on time. So I, I, would, um, I would request that we take a few minutes break and uh, reconvene again at 8.45 to, uh, to listen to the next four speakers. We've been sitting for... Uh, uh, quite some time. So let's take a five minutes break to convene at 845. Uh, 8.45 my times. Sorry. Whatever five minutes is for you. Let's get back in five minutes. Thank you. Sichang 不在的曾经失败放弃或感伤 
。我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞。不再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的。不再是奇迹，不再是幻想，此刻成感觉，全世界为我鼓掌。不必太在意身旁惊奇的目光，可以点点头，可以放声歌唱。我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞。不再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can, 没有什么。All right, um, Professor Zhang, get started. Okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm Chu Changzhang from South China Normal University. Uh, it's really my honor to be online to share my studies. Uh, I would like to thank the ICANN XYSA committee for giving me the chance. Today, my talk is about upconversion super-resolution microscopy. As we all know, light microscope is a powerful tool, can help people to see many tiny things like animal cells, bacteria. But the resolution of a microscope is always diffraction limited, uh, specifically following this formula uh, is proposed by Abe. But uh, for visible light, it's always larger than 20 nanometers. So to break the diffraction limit, super resolution microscopy has emerged. Uh, the Nobel Prize 2014 was awarded to the three uh, pioneering scientists in this field. It can enable imaging with resolution down to nanometer scale. So we can see what we couldn't see before. Uh, as uh, important uh, super resolution modality, stimulated emission depression stat is based on the confocal microscope configuration. The stat breaks the diffraction limit using the second laser to deplete the fluorescence and then narrow down the uh, uh, spore size. It's a purely physical method, so no imaging reconstruction, no imaging artifacts, and can enable 3D imaging. But since its invention, actually, that suffers from many problems like uh, high laser intensity, high complexity, and also photo bleaching. So how to solve these problems is very important, but also very challenging, actually. Uh, my solution to this problem is the development method uh, by harnessing the excitation and the emission uh, process of the photon upconversion, which is a process can absorb two or more low energy uh, photons then emit one high energy photon. For example, we can use a near infrared laser to excite out blue emission, green emission. So as a, a very powerful technology, it has been widely used in many applications like uh, IR photonics, nanophotonics. Okay, this is an overview of the work in my lab, uh, focusing on the super resolution. Uh, I develop uh, a lot of mechanism to uh, compress the spore size B and develop efficient, universal, simple upconversion super resolution microscopy. To break the constraint of the high power step laser, I propose to reduce the saturation intensity. And then finally, the laser intensity was reduced by five, almost five orders. To break the constraint of inflexible depression wavelengths in, uh, instead, I managed to unlock the stat wavelength and the fluorescence spectrum, and it's good for multicolor imaging. 
to break the constraint of low nonlinearity and multiform microscopy, uh, I achieved the whole nonlinear and achieved the three dimensional sublocation using single uh, in. Okay, let me introduce one by one. Uh, the first is low power laser. Uh, according to the standard formula, you see, if we want to shrink the spore size, we have to increase the ratio of uh, laser intensity to saturated intensity. Saturated intensity, I said, is the laser intensity required for 55, uh, 50% depletion. It's uh, inversely proportional to uh, emission lifetime cross section. You know, organic uh, size have very ultra short lifetime. So I said it's not. In this case, the laser required for that is very big, uh, would be very huge. So my uh, idea is to reduce high size. Why not? Actually, it can also have to reduce the spore size just using low power laser because the long lifetime optimization have such a potential. But the big challenge is to how to realize emission, uh, uh, emission depletion in the optimization system. In many studies, they always got emission enhancement instead. So no depression. Uh, in our conversion, you know, the energy levels, energy pathways is always uh, uh, complicated. Uh, only light matter interaction like that doesn't work for depression. So I propose to combine matter and matter interaction. In 2015, uh, uh, I uh, using the uh, iterative ion to help dissipate the energy of the urbans and uh, uh, enable about 30% uh, depression. This is the first report of the near-infrared optimization depression. After two years later, by using the cross-relation between the same emitters, so we improved the depression efficiency. You see here, uh, when applied the second laser, the blue emission can be depleted at about 96%. Well, interesting, the saturated intensity was reduced by almost two orders. Yeah, uh, this is, you know, this is the reason why we just started this project. So we are lucky we made it. With such uh, high efficiency, we uh, build the subrosmic system and perform the uh, super resolution imaging as well as biological imaging. You know, uh, the resolution down to 62 nanometers. Here, we only need low power, continuous wave, near infrared laser. So it's very efficient and simple. And also, photo bleaching free uh, is good for long term observation. Yes, there's no end for the quest to uh, technology progress. This year, we uh, proposed another method, cascade amplified depletion. Uh, you know, uh, the, the high order multiphoton emission, the stronger power dependence on the sensitizing. So, if we're using a laser to deplete the sensitizing energy by say say by 50%, the full photon would be depleted by 70, 75%. Similarly, for three photon, it would be up to 87.5%. So in this study, so we almost uh, achieved the 100 depletion for the three photon blue emission. And also the saturated intensity was reduced by almost four orders compared to traditional stats. Uh, yes, uh, recently, very recently, we uh, also proposed another novel method. It's totally different from uh, STAD. has nothing to do with that. Actually, uh, we call it surface migration emission depression. Here, we use the surface quenching effect on the nanoparticle surface to replace the law of stimulated emission. Uh, it's a process like, the, like a volcanic eruption. You know, the energy inside the Earth is dissipated by the volcano on the Earth's surface. So the, the process is very similar. Actually, the surface quenching effect of the nanoparticle is, uh, has been known, considered to be a lacking effect for the low brightness. So, but in here, we change the waste to treasure and in turn take advantage of the surface quenching effect. Uh, so, uh, uh, SMAT is very high efficient and is not governed by STAT again. And uh, to break the diffraction limit, uh, the limitation of the stat, so can enable ultra low saturation intensity about five orders uh, lower than traditional uh, stat, and also its best record for upper conversion to super resolution. So that can enable a very high resolution down to 17 nanometers using only one CW laser of less than five milliwatts. 
Uh, and also we did biological imaging uh, using smart resolution. Okay, the second part is Marikana. Marikana is the basic requirement for the fluorescent microscopy, but the wavelength of that beam is determined uh, for for fluorescent color, so it's inflexible. Uh, for the multi color star system, you see usually need uh, multiple star lasers. So you know they are all your first laser. So the system is very complicated, also high cost, hard to handle. To break uh, to address these issues, uh, we uh, proposed limited uh, emission assisted migration up conversion. The basic idea is to uh, cut over the energy supply from core to shell. So for these two four different uh, nanoprops of the four corners, they they sh they have different uh, corner shell, but the same but the share the same core. So when we apply instead for the same core, we can simultaneously decrease the uh, four corners. So uh, uh, and then uh, as well, we achieve the four corners uh, uh, superlative imaging just using one single star laser. Uh, recently, we uh, proposed another method uh, named stimulated emission induced excitation depression. The stacks. The basic idea is to cut off the energy from the sensitizer to the emitters. You know, the sensitizer can give energy to many different emitters of different colors. So, in this work, we depleted nine different emitters and also demonstrated the multi color imaging just using one single star laser. It's fixed. So it's universe, it, it, it's flexible. The third part is a single beam super resolution. You know, the nonlinearity of multi photon fluorescence is useful to improve the resolution uh, following this formula. N stands for the N photon process. But in traditional multi photon process, you know, even on the strong fluorescent laser, the nonlinearity is low, maybe two photon, three photon, four photon. And also the double wavelength will compromise the resolution improvement. So it cannot realize true super resolution. Uh, break, to break this constraint, uh, we first uh, build this triple soft system. Uh, it can be excited at uh, short wavelength and they emit four order emissions. Here we only need 30, 30 microwatts and uh, achieved uh, about one fifth wavelength resolution, much higher than traditional half wavelength uh, resolution. Yes, if, uh, if we can scale the N photon to 10 T, 30, maybe the resolution could be much higher, yeah? So do you think it is possible? Uh, so uh, photo of lungs, PA, occurring in less than eight meters, it can give rise La, huge nonlinearity. Maybe it could be used for super resolution, but the photo avalanche, uh, since its uh, discovery, has long been uh, restricted to uh, uh, bulk material or low temperature. Recently, we proposed the migration photo avalanche mechanism to enable effect at the nanoscale at low temperature. Uh, so, in the YP, uh, a PR adopted system, we achieved the 26 order emissions. And interestingly, this effect can be migrated to other emitters and also can be uh, the nonlinearity can be multiplied, so scale up to 46 orders, which uh, with such, uh, su uh, such a huge nonlinearity, we can perform single beam uh, uh, super resolutions. You see here, uh, the power is only 300 microwatts. And it can deliver uh, resolution down to six to nanometers. So the, sim the system is very simple, but the delivery record resolution of my uh, multi photon image. Yes, the linearity of PA uh, and can also be extended to three dimensional imaging. Uh, recently, we improved the linearity to 55 uh, photon uh, together with self interference on the mirror. We achieved one single beam uh, driven uh, 3D uh, super resolution. Actually, the resolution is three dimension isotopic and they can update to uh, sub, uh, sub six nanometers, something about uh, 64 nanometers here, and they just using one single beam laser power. Actually, this is something is very current or important for other super resolution modalities. Okay, to sum up, 
I developed to uh, efficient, universal, simple upconversion super solution to break the theoretical uh, limitations of third and multi photon microscopy. Uh, to, uh, I proposed uh, several mechanisms to continuously reduce the satellite intensity and then reduce the required laser intensity, finally, about five orders. Uh, by taking the idea of cutting off the energy from the sensor piping, we depleted the uh, uh, nine uh, colors emissions using one single cell laser. Uh, to achieve a single beam uh, microscopy, uh, we achieved a huge optical nonlinearity up to 26 to 50 uh, file orders. So, I achieved a three dimensional super resolution just using one single uh, low power excitation beam. Okay, where are we going? Uh, as I discussed, uh, the super optimal super resolution has many advantages like uh, zero node photo bleaching is good for long term observation, and the near infrared light is good for the tissue as well as low uh, power, low damage. Anyway, this merit would favor biological applications like uh, live cell animal imaging. Uh, for example, one ongoing project in our lab in collaboration with other groups is uh, about the uh, how to do long term imaging, super imaging for uh, monitoring the interaction between uh, cancer cells and the exosome, uh, as well as the, uh, uh, the ex interaction between the cells with the uh, lipid not clear, which is similar to the MRN vaccine. So, so I, I think this topic would be very interesting. And uh, you know, optimization is uh, uh, purely mass, a physical method. So beyond the imaging, it can also figure out applications like uh, deflection unlimited lithography and uh, photo activation. Actually, it's already been used by other groups for uh, deflection unlimited optical storage. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm, I would be very grateful to my students for hard working and to my collaborators for the important support. And uh, I'm very proud of what have we have achieved, all of made in uh, China. That's all for my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's time for questions. Uh, any questions from the committee? Uh, now, how does it uh, if I can step in, how does your work um, relate to some of the progress, especially what we saw when you were, I don't know whether you watched the Rising Stars in Light. There was a lot of work on, uh, there was some work on uh, improving resolution in microscopy. How does your work compare to those? Oh, you mean the resolution compared to other technologies? Mm -hmm. uh, Yes, uh, actually, you know, yeah, we, we of course, we, uh, uh, we, we, we think that resolution is very important. So we, we were trying to improve the resolution, but at the same time, we want to uh, improve the resolution using very simple uh, uh, method, like uh, one single bin or very ultra low power, you know, it's more power efficient. And also because of the traditional start system, you know, they need to use ultra fast lasers and the two beams. In that case, the system is very complicated. So uh, what we are trying to do is uh, improve the resolution just using very simple uh, method. And also, uh, you know, we only use continue wave. It's also uh, cost, cost effective. And the laser is, uh, can be ultra long, as low as to uh, uh, microwatt, uh, milliwatt, as I uh, discussed previously, I think. so. Uh, the resolution also is very important, but also how to get the resolution is also very important, I think. So I, I wa we want to deliver some very simple technology. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, okay, I, I want to uh, answer your question for short. Okay. Yeah, but, but, you know, when, when you're using simple approaches to, to work on a very complex system, uh, for example, when you're proposing the use of this in biology, in your last quorum that you have on the slide here, have you looked at the uh, potential interferences from biosystems and other complex systems like that? Can you still achieve the same resolution if you have a complex uh, biological system? Yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, one, for example, one point, yeah, I think it's uh, compatible to the biological system because, you know, 
Actually, the nanoprobe we synthesize can be done to uh, five nanometer, eight, 10 nanometer, anyways, uh, smaller than 10 nanometer. So it uh, should be comparable to the uh, some uh, subcellular structure. Like for example, the the, the cell derived axon is maybe is 100 to 100 nanometers in diameter. So we can label these structures using a very small upconversions. So in this case, we can uh, monitor them using super resolution. So I think it's, it's compatible to the uh, uh, biological uh, systems. And uh, okay, uh, any other questions from the committee? All right. If there's no so maybe a follow-up question on on what you all already started, uh, Martin. Uh, mm -hmm. Like Martin already said, there's already many technologies out there, and super resolution uh, microscopy is widely used. So, what is holding your technology still back? Why is it not widely adopted in other laboratories in the, in the world? Do you do you foresee it will maybe even become commercially available in the near future, or what are the scientific bottlenecks that need to be still addressed? Uh, okay, uh, thank you for your question. So you are asking for future application also, and uh, maybe uh, for, um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, you know, in, uh, anyway, yeah, for, uh, in terms of commercialization, I think maybe it's, it's quite uh, uh, possible because of the technology in our uh, method is, is very simple. So in that case, the cost is very low. So we can easily uh, translate it to the, uh, the other, uh, anyway, to try to commercialize the, this, uh, the system, the, 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 the program. Mm -hmm. You know, the laser here is very simple and the, the, the whole system is very stable and they, it's, we don't need so much time to maintain the system. I think it's very simple and uh, it's good for future com commercialization and also it's good for applications, I think. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, very good, so I wanna thank you very much for your presentation. Okay. Uh, our next thank speaker. You. Thank, you. thank you all, thank you all, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sarah, please share your slides. Um, right, uh, take us away. Great, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. So uh, today I will switch topics slightly and talk about how uh, my lab is working to engineer a useful quantum technology out of uh, trapped calcium ions. So before I start, I'd like to acknowledge my group. They're an enterprising bunch. I just started about six months ago at the University of Washington, um, and we're starting to build up the lab. So unfortunately, no experimental result as of yet, but I hope I'll get you excited anyway. So the goal of our lab in the field in general is to build a fully fault-tolerant universal quantum computer. And first, let's break down what I mean by that. So by fault-tolerant, I mean that you don't have to worry about errors at all. And then universal, I mean, we can do anything with infinite, of course, maybe there's some caveats here, maybe we need nearly infinite time, nearly infinite qubits, but in the same way that your classical computer can compute anything, uh, uh, we'd like a quantum computer to be uh, able to do the same. So one question might be, uh, why hasn't uh, this happened already? Uh, and I think the answer to that comes if we look at the error rates that we see in a classical computer versus a quantum computer. So a classical bit, you know, for instance, the transistor in your computer has errors uh, at like negative 10 to the 10 to the minus 17 uh, uh, or every uh, 10 to the 17th uh, operation, you have one error on average. Uh, that is basically fault tolerant, right? We never have to worry about our phones, uh, you know, messing up a little bit. Um, quantum bits, on the other hand, have orders of magnitude more errors. Every 1,000 uh, operations on average, you'll get a wrong answer when you try to do an operation on your quantum bit. And so this is really hindering, I think this is the crux of the issue that's hindering the adoption uh, and the creation of useful quantum systems. And so this is what we'd like to, to work on in our lab. Uh, this looks quite daunting, but luckily the theoreticians have helped us. 
Uh, and we can just as in classical systems, we can use error corrections. We can also do quantum error correction. And the idea is very similar to classical error correction, where you encode your data into some redundant uh, set of bits to be able to and use that redundancy to correct and detect errors. Here, we're going to encode our data. Again, now we have to talk about uh, Hilbert spaces, but we basically encode our data in a larger number of quantum bits. And so we can reduce our logical errors, um, uh, but to do this, we'll need more physical qubits. And so if we uh, ask, you know, what is the number of qubits that we need, we can take a simple example. And so we could use what's called the uh, surface code. The surface code is one particular uh, type of error correction code in quantum uh, systems that is quite, uh, you know, it's one of the leading uh, contenders for a final code. Um, and if we had these physical qubits with this one in 1000 error probability, and I gave you 10,000s of these qubits, we could construct a, um, a, a single logical qubit with error probabilities less than 10 to the minus 15th. Um, of course, these numbers uh, depend strongly on exactly your error model and the code and a lot of technical details, but this order of magnitude stands. And so this is promising, uh, but also we, it shows that we need a lot of uh, qubits. And to put that in the context of an algorithm that could actually um, people might care about, uh, we can look at Shor's algorithm. So Peter Shor discovered this algorithm, algorithm in the early 90s that allows us to factor a number into its prime factors faster than any uh, asymptotically faster than any classical algorithm. Um, so this uh, RSA, this is the basis of RSA encryption uh, that encrypts all the data or most of the data that we send uh, back and forth on communication systems. And usually we use 2048 bit numbers uh, to do this encoding. So to make the Shor's algorithm useful for, uh, for us, we would need to be able to factor a number like this. Unfortunately, uh, taking into account the error correction overhead, to do this, we need, and I think these are actually conservative estimates, 10 million qubits and a billion gates. And we have to compare that to today's numbers where we have about a, a 10 to 100, you know, a few Google and IBM maybe have 100 or so qubits and about 100 gates. So we're ordered many orders of magnitude uh, away from what we need. So, um, and you know, I'd like to hopefully convince you that we can get there with trapped ions, or at least to get toward uh, starting the way, uh, part of the way there. Um, so uh, first I'll start off with a brief introduction about trapped ion quantum information processing. And then I will uh, discuss uh, our ideas for optical control that doesn't, uh, does not limit fidelity. Okay, so first, how do we trap ions? Uh, the first thing we do, we have to create calcium ions. So we start with an ultra high vacuum chamber with uh, vacuum pressures of 10 to the minus 11 millibar. So actually significantly better than the vacuum you see uh, in deep space. Um, we in there stick a bunch of uh, like a chunk of uh, calcium and then just heat that up resistively to create a, a vapor of, calcium, of neutral calcium. Then we use two lasers to uh, rip off an electron to, uh, uh, to create this positively charged calcium 40 ion. What's nice is this is isotope selective and we care about the isotope because the different isotopes have different spin properties. And we like the one with the spin property that we, that we know that can encode information uh, with uh, high fidelity. We then have to trap these ions, and these ionic systems are nice because they have because they're uh, charged. We can trap them using electric fields. So first, we use RF electrodes. Um, so just two RF electrodes can create a confining potential in uh, two dimensions. The idea here is that you create a time varying field that's varying very quickly, much faster than the ion can move. And so the ion sees an average of those fields and sees a full confining potential in two dimensions. And then we use DC electrodes in the other dimension. And with that, we can uh, trap a chain of ions as pictured here. Uh, we can do that up to tens, hundreds of ions, but we can also uh, engineer these systems uh, to create arrays of, uh, of ions and potentially uh, trap up to thousands. And then once we have these ions trapped, what's nice about uh, ions is that we can degree, we can control all degrees of freedom optically. So you see a set of lasers here, um, and uh, with these four lasers, we can control all the degrees of freedom, all the electronic degrees of freedom of our system. Okay, so what does this mean in terms of our quantum bits? 
So uh, this, this is the transition that we use for our qubit. It is in the near infrared um, at 730 nanometers. Uh, this is a quadrupole transition. So this is a very weakly allowed transition. So the lifetime, if we excite the electron into this excited state, it will stay here for a second. If we excite the, uh, the system into a phase sensitive superposition state, we can get coherence times of 200 milliseconds. And we can, uh, and this uh, characterizes the, you know, how often you get an error or how long you can wait until you have an error. Um, we can get single qubit gate fidelity. So we can change the, the, the state of a single qubit in about one microsecond uh, and with four nines of fidelity. So we only have errors one every 10,000 times we try to uh, prepare the state of an ion. We can also measure the state through this dipole transition. So this is a, a really quick transition. It fluoresces very heavily. So that's the one nanosecond lifetime to get uh, gigahertz levels of photons out. But it only fluoresces if we're in the ground state. So if we're in the ground or zero state, we see a lot of fluorescence. If we're in the one state, then we don't see any fluorescence. And so with this, we can get very high fidelity uh, state detection as well. And again, a kind of around 10 to the minus four errors, four nines of uh, fidelity. But trapped ions are even better than that. Um, we, so that tells you that we can get single qubit gate fidelities, but we also have these motional modes. So these trapped ions, these ions are all trapped in a harmonic potential. We can actually quantize this potential in all three dimensions. Um, and so if we have a single ion, we have three motional modes, one in each of your three cardinal directions. If you have N ions, you have three N modes. And uh, these motional modes, one, can be cooled to the ground state. So we can use, again, our lasers. Trapped ions are all about lasers. We can use our lasers to um, cool the uh, motional modes down to micro Kelvin, um, uh, even, at, you know, even if our whole system is at room temperature. We can also engineer the occupation. So we can create any sort of quantum state that you would like out of these trapped ion systems. Um, also, these trapped ion, uh, these motional modes are shared between all of the ions in the trap. So even if you have these ions that are spaced by a, a few microns, all of them share a single emotional mode. And that allows you to create entanglement between any subset of the ions in the same trap. And this means that any to any connectivity is possible. And this separates ions from other leading contenders for quantum information processing, such as superconducting systems, which uh, the connectivity is defined in fabrication and cannot be uh, changed afterwards. Okay, and then we can do these two qubit entangling gates in tens of microseconds uh, with three nines of fidelity. So not as good as our other operations, but, uh, but we're getting there. And so if we look back to what we need for a fault tolerant universal quantum computer, we can see that we have the fidelities to be able to build this logical qubit with errors probabilities of less than 10 to the minus 15. So now all we need to do is trap, control, and read out uh, 10,000 ions just to create one logical qubit. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of um, the time. So uh, one easy way to control trapped ions is to just take a very large laser beam. Um, if you have, what do I have here? Nine. I if you have 10 ions, your uh, the structure uh, extends on the order of 20 microns. So you can just take a fairly large uh, laser beam, excite them all at once, and create a fully entangled state where the ions are either all in the ground state uh, or all in the excited state. And this is already a very exciting entangled state, but unfortunately it doesn't give you universal quantum control. But what you can do instead is if you have very good optical engineering, you can individually address your ion and that allows you to engineer the state of your quantum system um, and allows you to do uh, all of the operations that you need to show that uh, you can provably do uh, fault or universal quantum computing, not fault time, just universal. Um, and so if we would like to do have this individual ion addressing, the requirements for the system are first uh, four orders of magnitude on off uh, isolation, as well as ion ion isolation. So we don't want any crosstalk between our ions. We want when it's off, we want it to be really off. 
We need uh, switching speeds faster than our gate speed, so much faster than a megahertz. And we need, okay, I wrote here tens of individually controlled channels. That's our lab's goal in the near future. But at some point, we'll need millions of individually controlled channels. And we'd also like to be able to reconfigure our beams flexibly. This will allow us to, even when we have a million qubits, not need a million beams, but have some sort of, uh, you know, uh, laser interaction zone. So right now, how these systems are set up is with free space. And free space systems are quite easy to uh, engineer. They, uh, you can easily get a high quality beam shape. Uh, unfortunately, they're bulky. So to build a, a fully active path, you need about one meter of space and that just for a single path. They also take a lot of RF power. So to be able to switch these channels on and off, you need an R, uh, radio frequency source and you need about one watt per channel. And so if I wanna build a, a quantum computer and I tell you that you need a thousand watts, maybe in, for some people that wouldn't be too scary, but it'd be better to bring that down orders of magnitude. Um, they're also hard to align and they're not flexible. You can ask your grad student to maybe uh, align one beam, but uh, a million beams, they're gonna, uh, they're gonna walk out on you. Even two, they might walk out. Uh, so our approach here is in any, instead to go to integrated optics. Integrated optics um, leverage the uh, you know micro and nano fabrication uh, to build uh, on chip waveguides uh, that can that are compact, they're fast. Uh, because they're all on a single chip and it's a fairly small volume, they can be quite stable because you can temperature stabilize them much uh, much better. Um, of, cor of course, uh, these systems add complexity um, and they're because we need to use visible light, uh, this is really at the cutting edge of uh, what uh, what people can do. So our um, our uh, setup uh, will uh, is as follows. First, we'll have a trap that is optimized, a trap in an ultra high vacuum chamber that is optimized for high fidelity storage and operation of trapped ion qubits. And then externally to this, we'll have, we, as pictured here, um, a photonic integrated circuit um, that this, the, uh, we'll use a, a spatial light modulator to rearrange the beams, uh, image to a high NA objective. Uh, and this will allow us to uh, optimize the optics and traps separately, uh, reconfigure the excitation between experiments and allow us to test uh, improvements quickly. The next thing I'd like to talk about, the final thing I'd like to talk about is ion ion isolation. So the spacing between ions depends on the number of ions you have. And of course we want lots of ions to be able to do interesting things. Um, and uh, so here you can see the same trapping frequency, all the same parameters, but with uh, nine ions or 59 ions. And you can see that the crosstalk is indicated by this gray line here of an optical beam uh, will increase when you have 60 ions. Uh, this will become even worse when you uh, start thinking about the optical aberrations. And so we must get diffraction limited excitation uh, to be able to run these systems. So. Um, as a summary, I hope I've convinced you that we need reconfigurable control to uh, um, uh, to address these ions and active photonic integrated circuits uh, will allow us to do that. One question remains is how do you efficiently calibrate so many uh, parameters? Um, and uh, you know we've there um, for sure, even if we try to engineer our system uh, as well as possible, there will be still coherent errors, crosstalk errors, and uh, some open questions that we'd like to consider is can you correct for these coherent errors? And can you efficiently optimize multi-qubit gates in a large string? Um, and with that, I would be happy to take any questions that you may have. All right, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> any questions from the panel? Hi, um, Sarah, uh, interesting work. Um, so I'm just curious for the trap uh, right now you're using, is there any possibility in the future you can further uh, integrate the trap uh, along with the, uh, 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 for example, the photonics chip so that you uh, move one step further in terms of integration? Yes, definitely. And uh, I didn't have time to talk about it, but this is a big thrust of our group. So um, first, you can again use microfabrication to make these electrodes on a chip or maybe in a wafer. Um, and that allows you to get to be that allows you to be able to trap tens of thousands of ions. And then you could either a integrate uh, waveguides directly with your chip. 
There's a lot of materials considerations that you have to worry about because these dielectrics ions, uh, they can be trapped by electric fields, but they're also incredibly sensitive to electric fields. So there's a lot of uh, materials considerations that have to be done, but a, actually a big focus of our uh, group is integrating uh, focusing optics or integrated uh, photonics with the, with the chip itself. But yeah, great question. Yeah, uh, following up on that question, uh, one thing I imagine would be a, a major challenge is once you move from this vacuum trap to the, those on-chip traps, uh, defacing uh, would be a big issue for your uh, qubits. So uh, what are the uh, uh, measures you are planning to take uh, to mitigate these challenges? What was the challenge? Sorry. Uh, uh, defacing. Oh, like, um, so, like it, it uh, so, like... Peeling off? Uh, no, basically uh, losing its quantum oh, defacing. coherence. Oh, Sorry, sorry, sorry. Defacing. Yeah, it's yeah. 4 a.m. here, so I'm still, my uh, <laughs> my brain is probably not, uh, but yes, defacing is a huge problem with these surface traps, actually. Um, you get something called a heating rate, which is due to these noisy electric fields. And actually, I think there's a lot to be learned from surface science here, because it's unclear why you get the, this motional defacing. Um, and uh, there are a lot of phenomenological reasons that we've come up with, uh, but there is no good theory. And I think we really need material scientists to help us uh, develop better um, materials that have uh, lower number of charge traps, uh, so better surfaces. And so again, another thing that my group is looking into is using doped silicon uh, for these electrodes instead of these deposited films. Right now, people use deposited like aluminum films. The surface conformity is incredibly bad, uh, leading to lots of little charge traps. And we hope that using uh, silicon with a, a beautiful uh, uh, surface structure could help with that, but it remains to be seen. Okay, great. Right. Uh, one just, okay. Yeah, one, one final, do, do you know uh, Hans Demot? Uh, yes, yes. I yeah, uh, so nice Hans Demot was the first, he won a, a Nobel Prize. He, he, demonstrated these RF traps, uh, and then he moved to University of Washington, and my lab uh, is uh, on the building that my lab is in. There is a picture of one of the first uh, RF traps, so yes. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. Um, yeah. wait, wait, please share your slide. Uh, Sarah, maybe one quick question uh, before we get it. You showed calcium uh, knocking off one electron to calcium one. Is that the most stable state of the calcium? or is the metastability necessary? So the, um, uh, you mean when we excite to the excited state, that metastable state, um, that we we need a state that is, there's conflicting uh, needs. One, we need it to be stable, but we also need to be able to change it. So that one second is a good um, uh, compromise between coherence and controllability. Okay. Thank you. For the sake of time, let's uh, stop there and have our next speaker, Wei Bao. Uh, please take it away. You're muted, Wei. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks, Martin, for the kind introduction. Um, so today I'm going to talk about three a little bit diverse topic uh, with uh, cavities in nanophotonic on both imaging, trapping, and the bosons and condensate. So all these three stories simply inspired by a very simple geometry. I think if you learn a little bit of optics, that will be the two parallel uh, metal mirrors geometry, which is most uh, common resonator people will use. <clears throat> so let's start with the first part on imaging. So I think for this audience, we all know very interesting science always happen on small scales. However, if you try to probe those interesting signs with optical microscopy or spectroscopy, you will inevitably encounter the optical diffraction limit, uh, essentially first discovered by Ernst Abbe. So the, the, this is the optical diffraction limit tells you the spatial resolution of your spectroscopy or microscopy system will be on the order of incident wavelength. So essentially half of the wavelengths for the visible will be around 300 nanometers. So anything smaller than 300 nanometer is not possible to be seen. So in order to overcome this uh, great challenge, 
in the field, the first method to overcome this diffraction limit is for the conventional near field scanning optical microscopy. So essentially in short ensemble. So in this method, the, the way they do this is essentially they have a tapered optical fiber coated with aluminum and the, on the end they open an uh, aperture. And if you bring this aperture with very small sizes, very close to the substrate of the sample and you rather scan this aperture and the final imaging of this uh, resolution will be determined by the aperture due to the near field effect instead of by the wavelengths. However, although the method is very beautiful and attractive, but if you look in details a little bit careful, quickly one realizes the optical uh, signal propagating down into the optical fiber all determined by the wavelengths. When they try to squeeze the light into a very small aperture, essentially due to the wavelengths are much larger than the aperture, essentially all the light will run into a cutoff issue. So the fundamental waveguide mode will become reflected back and only evanescence will, will come out from this tiny aperture. So essentially the method suffer extremely low transmission rate. You essentially for 50 nanometer diameter aperture guide one photon out of a million photon. The transmission is 10 to minus six, extremely low, uh, very poor signal noise ratio. So basically nothing can be measured um, with a great efficiency. So why was a PhD student, the question I asked is, can one realize a high throughput optical probe to squeeze light to the nanometer scale with a great efficiency? The answer is yes. Um, without going into mathematic detail, we have to understand a little bit why the enzyme probe will have a cutoff issue. So that comes from the circular geometry of this aluminum uh, coating. So essentially the electrical field always want to be perpendicular on the metal surface. As we all know, perfect electrical conductor is the best uh, simply uh, explanation for the metal film. So essentially with the circular geometry, uh, the electrical field want to bending in this, in the fundamental mode. Such a bending will have a cost. The spatial bending of electromagnetic wave has to happen on the scale of wavelength. So how to overcome this ensemble problem? You essentially design a waveguide, which is very simple parallel plate, there's no spatial bending of electromagnetic wave, greatly inspired by this concept. So here we come the Campanile tip. So essentially it's a tapered a parallel plate, a cavity, you gradually taper down and adiabatically squeeze the light into the nanometer scale. Because the geometry of the optimized device structure very much represents the similar geometry of Berkeley Campanile power. If you are like me at the time, a grad student who worked very late at night, you will see, okay, essentially this is the, the light at the tip of the Campanile tower, essentially what we want uh, at the optical fibers end. So essentially Campanile tip is a non cutoff waveguide to squeeze light to the nanometer scale. Um, so we come into the clean room and the fabricate this uh, Campanile tip geometry at the end of the optical fiber with a lot of effort. But without going to the detail, here is the final structure you can see. Here is a gold and silicon dioxide exposed, and this structure is sitting at the end of the optical fiber. So experimentally measured, the transmission is larger than 10% on a 40 nanometer diameter aperture, which is five order of magnitude better than traditional ensemble, about a similar size. With this greatly enhanced throughput, one can do excite locally and collect locally the optical signal and to see the near field imaging on the scale about uh, electron uh, beam uh, microscopy. So they are comparable with SEM in spatial resolution and much better than confocal uh, imaging. And you can also see a lot of more detail due to the surface sensitivity of this uh, near field probe comparable uh, compared with the far field method, which will probe the entire thickness of the sample. Does the Method is not only working on one dimensional, which is less challenging on near field uh, imaging, but also will work on low quantum yield samples such as uh, W, uh, such as uh, MOS2 samples uh, in the CVD. As you can see, the confocal micro PL shows a very homogeneous sample. While you do the Campanile imaging, you will see a lot of greater details. And uh, in contrast, you see a lot of homogeneities. So this is a great success. So we are going to switch gear a little bit for the second part. 
um, still inspired by the geometry of about the two metal plate. Once we have a two metal plate, we are going to support optical mode in, in between. So a little bit, uh, you know, go into detail of this. So if you have optical mode, we can quantify, quantize the uh, electromagnetic mode. So a simple method will do so is by a simple harmonic oscillator model to quantize the electromagnetic wave. And the, such a direct consequence of this will be each mode that you will have a mode energy described by h bar omega, the frequency, and then the photon number, and the plus of one divided by half, essentially is a quantum mechanical zero energy. So essentially, the quantum mechanical effects tells you after you do the quantize of the electromagnetic wave is even each mode that you don't have any photon, a physical photon there, there's a vacuum, you still have a mode energy. Such a direct consequence of the quantization of electromagnetic wave will lead to an interesting effect, so-called Casimir force. So why you have a, a attractive force? So essentially is if you have two charged new, neutron uh, metal plate and they have a large distance in between the two metal plate, you will support a lot of this uh, mode by the standing wave condition. But if you decide you want to have a little bit smaller distance, a lot of the mode will be pushed out from this uh, configuration. So which means a smaller distance of the two metal plate means less energy, less zero energy, because you have less mode. So essentially the system will automatically minimize the energy by putting the distance smaller, smaller, smaller automatically. So such a quantum mechanical effect called the Casimir force can be very large at a small distance. It can be one atmosphere pressure at a distance about 10 nanometer, and it's always attractive, interestingly. So why we would care about uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this Casimir force? Simply because we have a lot of MIMES device and uh, uh, those MAMS device will have uh, um, um, a size that's if you eventually decide by the Casimir force, simply because if you have the MAMS device structure, they always want to uh, irreversibly adhere to each other in order to avoid this catastrophically adhere to the each, each other. You have to make the device size large enough to against this uh, quantum force. So essentially that's limit the final size of the MAMS device, which is not ideal. So the holy grail for engineering this vacuum Casimir force will be eventually a lot of people's mind to create a stable equilibrium condition. So essentially in the long range, you will have attractive force. While in the short range, you have a re repulsive force. And then your MAMS device will sit in the equilibrium position to solve the adhesion problem in a MAMS device. However, uh, although the thought is very beautiful, the reality is there's no repulsive Casimir force. Casimir force always want to be attractive, but can you effectively achieve some Casimir equilibrium out of all the components that are attractive? There's a simple real world example. We can create such a things with all attractive component. For example, this is my wife. Upon graduation at UC Berkeley, apparently in between me and my wife, there's a strong attraction force. So how to uh, create a repulsive force in between me and my wife with a, out of a attractive opponent? The answer is very simple. When we have kids, all the kids and us, they are uh, attractive. But when the kids are presented in between me and my wife, they become effectively create a repulsive force between me and my wife. Greatly inspired by this common cases scenario, I know a lot of you are laughing. We uh, essentially designed a customer force out of this uh, all attractive component. So essentially in this case, we have two cavity component. One is gold, one, the other one is also gold. We put acetone and the teflon in between the two gold. The acetone and the teflon essentially behave like, like my kids. They are attractive mutually, but they create an effectively repulsive force in between the gold plate, which is the basic concept. 
this is the first customer equilibrium uh, engineering. So excitingly, uh, um, excitingly, um, um, they, they can also show uh, this uh, gold plate moving around with a uh, uh, with a brownie implant brownie motion. So essentially, showing this uh, Casimir motion um, uh, is successfully demonstrate this uh, uh, Casimir equilibrium is formed in the vertical di directions. So this is a great step towards the final vacuum engineering about uh, the quantum force. So let's switch gear again to the third topic on the strong coupling side. If we have a very good uh, optical cavity and we could put a very good uh, semiconductor in the middle of this optical cavity. So effectively, what I mean is we have a good semiconductor with a good exciton, and we put this uh, good exciton semiconductor into the good cavity, and then the exciton will convert to photon, and the photon trapped by the cavity will reabsorb by the exciton semiconductor. And then if this coupling rate is much larger than the exciton dissipation rate, or the photon dissipation rate by coming out of the cavity, we will form a new hybridized particle called the exciton polariton. What's unique about exciton polariton is because exciton is a boson, photon is a boson, the hybridization particle is also a boson. Such a boson has very small effective mass. So as we all know, in the cold atom community, the cold atom boson Einstein condensate at very low temperature, 170 nanokelvin, essentially is the foundation about in the cold atoms uh, quantum simulation. Once you create a condensation, you essentially create a microscopically atom that follow quantum mechanics with a sizable size you can manipulate and then distribute it into a periodic potential and then essentially study the quantum mechanical effect such as superfluidity or Hamiltonian. So with this uh, new quasiparticle particle exciton polariton, people show you can demonstrate similarly for Einstein condensate, but now you don't need to go to one microkelvin, you can go to 10 Kelvin, already much better than the cold atom, but a similar physics. So here the motivation of us is we want to do room temperature, essentially see the quantum mechanical effect that used to be only feasible at extremely low temperature, nine order magnitude, but now we are now can do it at room temperature. However, such a holy dream it's remain elusive due to many materials in imperfections. However, um, recently we achieved a big breakthrough by taking advantages of the solution grow halide proskite, which can be solution processed and then in situ drawn into this uh, nano ca cavities, but uh, as good as a garnet arsenide. Here we show the grown material has a spatial inhomogeneity with a three plus three or minus uh, three. Uh, MeV, so essentially one nanometer on the polarity mode, which is much better even than the garnet arsenide MeV grow sample. With this gray sample, we can show this superfluidity behavior transition at room temperature. Essentially, you can see at the very beginning, you see a lot of scattering of the, about the defect, but after the superfluidity transition, you see no scattering. They are frictionlessly flow across this defect. What's more interestingly, we can also construct the lattices. Used to be only done with cold atom um, 10 years ago. Now we can do optically, but at the room temperature, you can see this very nicely, even including spin frustration uh, uh, configuration can be constructed. With that, I want to acknowledge my group member and the mentors, collaborators, and the funding agency for the support. And with that, thank you for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that's an amazing talk, and uh, I really like your, your analogy. I have to steal those for your teaching um, about fermions and, uh, and bosons. Yeah, thanks, Marty. Yeah. All right, uh, questions for the panel, from the panel. Any questions? Yep. Maybe I have one. Uh, thank you very much. It was nice to see also the old story about the near field scanning optical microscope. So I didn't remember that paper um, with that um, dome shaped tip. So 
So how about lateral life um, um, sneaking out where you don't want? Normally you have the metal all around, but here you seem to have a um, dielectric on one of the two sides. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good question. So in the um, that's actually point, uh, an excellent point. So um, we don't have a background uh, leak out. Uh, the reason behind it is uh, there's a surface fast one. Essentially, I didn't have time to talk about it. So essentially, the photonic mode will convert it to surface plasma. Surface plasma will bond to the metal surface. So you will have a little bit of leak out, like the 1% if you run the calculation, but the majority of the light will already convert to surface plasma, which will bond by the dielectric and metal interface. So you don't have any um, leak out as long as you design this to convert the surface plasma first. So more detail. Have they the, been, yeah. Right. Have they been used afterwards? I mean, anyone pick that up? And because snow is all is so yeah. great, but nobody can use it because tips are so <laughs> difficult to make. Yeah. So I think that that's an excellent question. Snow is hard for a grad student um, to operate. Right. It take two years. So essentially, one of my friends, Professor Liu Ming in Riverside, he recently, I think, two years ago, published a, a Nature Photonic paper. They can achieve one nanometer spatial resolution. Essentially, the way they do this is a synthesis of nanowire with a tapered structure. So essentially, the key is to get rid of cutoff. So a conical shape with a surface pass bond on there is also a non-cutoff waveguide. So essentially, the way they do this is they just synthesis a bunch of this nanowire, and then you glue one of them onto the enzyme probe, and then no fabrication, and then one nanometer spatial resolution. And I think a lot of people are getting very excited on this. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Now, quick, uh, uh, maybe a, uh, even a simpler question. Do you think, uh, uh, looking at the oh, question okay. we had for the, uh, the cas uh, quantum Casimir effect, it scales to D, uh, with, uh, uh, inversely proportional to D4, which yeah. is what we see in, uh, with, uh, with a lot of um, uh, Van der Waal type and D by type interactions. It, it, it is is the distance, the proximity between the two uh, plates, uh, causing uh, adenomerization in the imaginary part of the associated or respective wave functions, or what exactly is going on to to make that force? So, uh, really uh, uh, yeah. So so this is uh so essentially, Martin, that's a good question. So I didn't have time to derive everything right mathematically. But uh, mm -hmm. for the Casimir force, essentially the fluctuation is on the one over D's force power. So mm -hmm. that will be a way, the D dependence will be a way about um, quantized, uh, quantify the Casimir force, whether this is a, indeed a Casimir force or that is electrostatic interaction, because electrostatic interaction follow a different uh, D dependency. So that's yeah. typically, but if you indeed have a charge neutrality, Two parallel plate that will be on the force power of D as uh, showed in, in the slide. I think, I think here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? You have a question? A quick one. Okay. Uh, maybe we migrate to our final speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thanks. Uh, really appreciate the, the talk. Uh, our last speaker is uh, Dr. Hu from University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, the floor is yours. Sorry. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Marty. So my uh, topic today is the engineer sales for cancer immunotherapy. I'm from University of Wisconsin-Madison. So currently the uh, cell making and the cell engineering is trending in the biomedical research field and uh, generate a lot of interest. So generally speaking, there are two basic approaches to do the cell making and the cell engineering. One is using the synthetic approach to mimic the physical chemical properties of the natural cells. For example, to mimic the cell behavior or cell functionalities. And the other approach to using the biological and chemical engineering approach to engineer cells, for example, to conjugate the therapeutics on the cell surface, using the genetic engineering approach to 
modified cells at the, at the therapeutic cells. So my lab that we do that with medicine, uh, we're concentrated on the on using engineering methods to modify cells either as the therapeutics or the uh, delivery system. So currently there are two research topics ongoing in my lab. So one is the engineering cells as the therapeutics. So in this research topic, basically we are using taking advantage of bioengineering strategies to modify to aiding the cells to be a live drug as the therapeutics. And the second topic in my lab is to engineer the cells as a drug delivery system. So basically we take advantage of chemical engineering approach to either conjugate or bind the therapeutics on the surface of the cells by taking advantage of the inherent interactions between the cell and the disease tissue to let these cells take the therapeutics to the disease tissue. So today I'll give you a quick glimpse of the, of the research on these two topics. So first the topic is engineering cell as the therapeutics. So in this topic, we focus on um, engineering this specific cell called macrophage to engineer this macrophage to become the chimeric antigen receptor modified macrophage, essentially uh, called macrophage. So quick background introduction about that disease we are talking. So brain tumor is the devastating cancer and it's a global burden. So this is the uh, global distribution or instance of the brain cancer brain tumor. So this is the, some statistics taking in the United States as the example. So I want to quickly you know, highlight several numbers here. So in only one year, 2022, there are over 88,000 cases diagnosed in the United States and uh, around like uh, 80,000 Americans died from the brain tumor. And the five-year survival rate for brain tumor is from 30%. And the locally, the Brain tumor is the second most common cancer diagnosed in children. So this is statistics about the brain tumor. So one specific brain tumor type called glioma. So glioma is accounting about 30% of all brain tumors. This is a very devastating disease. The average five-year survival of glioma is only around 7%. So currently in the clinic, the standard treatment options for glioma, including surgery, chemotherapy and the radiotherapy. But for each of these standard treatments, they are facing significant challenges. So for example, for chemotherapies, these chemotherapeutics, drugs is hard to penetrate the blood brain barriers. So this drug cannot get into the brain. And for the radiotherapies, this hypoxic glioma tissue is not sensitive to this type of treatment. And the surgery remains the major treatment options for glioma. And but due to the glioma cells are very aggressive and they can infiltrate into surrounding normal tissues. So when the surgeon do the surgery, they cannot identify the margins between the glioma cells and the normal tissue, which means they cannot completely remove all these glioma cells. So if you look into the survival time of this brain tumor, which received a brain tumor bearing patient which who received the partial removal of the glioma, their survival time are much shortened compared to the total resection of this glioma tissue. So this brings a huge problem for decreasing the survival time of the glioma, which is the tumor relapse. So, so we are, the, the central theme in our project is to cure or treat the post-surgical glioma recoverance. So here we focus on one specific type of cell called macrophage. So if you look into the you know, post-surgical glioma tissue, you will find that there's enormous of this tumor-associated macrophage infiltration in the glioma tissue. And we are thinking about you know, how to take advantage of these abundant macrophages infiltrating in the tumor tissue. So how do we turn these you know, bad guys into the anti-cancer cells? So then we think about, you know, how about do an uh, in-situ car microphage? So this is taking inspiration from the, from the recent success of CAR T cells, CAR chimeric antigen receptor T cells, which have huge success in treating, you know, either liquid cancer or the solid tumor in the clinic. So we are thinking about taking advantage of this, uh, you know, mature manufacturing of CAR T cells to do the, to do the CAR microphage. But in the clinic, for the CAR T cell manufacturers, it usually takes 
the long process from the isolating the T cells, collecting the blood, and then isolate the T cells uh, in the clinic, and then send these T cells into the lab or the uh, T cells manufacturer facilities to do the transfection and the engineering, and then send to the in vivo expansion, and then send back to the clinic to infuse back to the patient to, to complete the treatment. So this process is time consuming, and also it's always associated with high cost. So we are thinking about how do we, how can we do one step generation of the car macrophages? So this can save a lot of money. This can save a lot of time. So the, the central idea is pretty simple. So here, after the glioma resection surgery, so we fill this uh, post-surgical cavity with uh, injectable hydrogel. And in this hydrogel, we loaded uh, genetic engineering nanoparticles, which can target to this tumor infiltrating macrophages and do the genetic editing and to turn this macrophage into car macrophage. And this car macrophage can identify these residue glioma tissues and then do the phagocytosis to kill all these residue glioma tissues to prevent the glioma relapse. So the target here we select for treating the glioma residue uh, cells are DD133. So DD133 is a uh, is a marker that's overexpressed in the stem cells. So the kind of stem cells always responsive, is responsible for the tumor initiation, and the most importantly, they are responsible for the tumor recoveries. So they are the roots for the for the tumor recoveries and the tumor relapse. And we first in this project, we first using the bioinformatics uh, technology to identify that uh, there's the enormous difference between the glioma tissue and the normal tissue. Uh, in terms of the CD133 expression, and uh, most importantly, the glioma patients with the higher CD133 expression, showing the showing the, the lower survival time compared to the, the, the glioma patient with lower CD133 uh, expression. So here we conclude that the CD133 expression is negatively correlating with the glioma patient survival. And the, the whole, whole approach it's very straightforward. So here we construct a narrow particles with encoding of this car plasmid. And then we modify this uh, narrow particle with the macrophage targeting ligand. And uh, this is the construction of this car plasmid. And this is the morphology of these narrow particles. And then we uh, developed an injectable hydrogel, which can be uh, filled, can be filled into the post-surgical cavities. And after the, after the engineering, here we show that when you have these CD133 expressed beads, so after our, after our engineering approach, you can see here this green uh, fluorescence means the micro engineering macrophage, they can, uh, they can eat off a lot of this one, uh, CD133 expressed beads compared to the uh, blank nail particles and the free car uh, plasmid. And this is a video to show you that when you culture this green fluorescent labeled cancer cells with the, with the uh, red fluorescent labeled car megalophage, you can see that this megalophage can actively uh, eat these, these cancer cells, but they don't phagocyte, phagocytose these normal cells like astrocytes and the neurons, which is normal uh, tissue in the, in the brain. So next we perform the in vivo studies. So here we're using um, uh, Luciferase expressed the uh, glioma cells to monitor the tumor growth after the treatment. So here is the experimental section to show you how we do the surgery. So basically we have the brain tumor and then we do the resections. So after the resection, we fill in this cavity with our hydrogel loading with the uh, engineering nanoparticles. particles. And the, here basically we show that our engineering approach has delayed the tumor growth and also we combine this engineering approach with, with one uh, antibody approved in the clinic, which is anti uh, CD47 to block the don't eat me signal on the macrophage to boost this effect. So you can see here with this boosting effects, so they can significantly prolong the survival time of the glioma bearing mice. And most exciting we have performed uh, Perform this engineering engineering approach to treat the patient derived xenograft model to show the clinical relevance of our engineering approach. So basically, we isolate this glioma tissue from the patient, 
and then to implant this glioma tissue into the human mice mouse model and do the treatment. So here you show you can see that with our engineer approach in combination with the NT PD47 antibodies, we can control and delay the, the glioma tissue growth to and prolong the survival time of this glioma, human glioma tissue bearing mice. So this is the first uh, uh, first introduction about our approach or efforts in engineering cell therapeutics. In the next few minutes, I will uh, concentrate on our second research topic, which is engineering cell as the drug delivery system. So here, here in this project, we target the tumor paraptosis. The tumor paraptosis is the newly found, newly found programmed cell-based mechanism. So basically, these cancer cells are triggered by the LPS or the inflammasome, which can activate the specific, uh, specific protein signaling pathway, uh, such as the case base 11 or case base 1. And in the whole process, there's a one specific protein involvement is gastrin family. So this gastrin family was activated by uh, both proteins, and then they can drill a hole on the cell membrane to cause the uh, cell tumor cell paraptosis. But the cancer cells always has this self-defense system. So there's a one specific mechanism called the ES33 media cell membrane. So basically, you know, undergoing or Undergoing the, the tumor cells is undergoing the, the, the paraptosis, and then they can initiate this calcium ion influx to recruit this ESCIT3 machinery to participate in repairing of the cell membrane. So in our projects, we are uh, developed a combination strategies. So one in one part, we are initiate the tumor paraptosis by delivering this gasmin D and uh, and activate this gas D to drill a hole on the tumor cell membrane. And in another part, we are using an ESCIT inhibitor to block this ESCIT media cell membrane, cell membrane repair. So this is the morphology of our, our engineered bacteria with this gas D protein conjugate on the surface. So you can see here, this, uh, this VMP bacteria based delivery system can eff effectively trigger the tumor paraptosis as well as activate this uh, paraptosis related signal pathway. And the once, once, it, once it is in combination with the ESIT inhibitors, they can efficiently block the calcium influx process to inhibit this membrane repair pro, uh, process. So this beautiful image shows you that the, without the ESIT inhibitors, all these red proteins representing the ESIT machinery, they can be recruited to the cell membrane surface to participating in the cell membrane repair. But with the ESCIT inhibitors, all these red proteins are centralized or constrained in the intracellular compartment, which block this uh, membrane repair process. So to adapt our technology to for different application scenario, here we developed two different uh, approaches. One is for the injectable hydrogel to treat the uh, subcutaneous tumors for some inoperable tumors. We developed a lifelized cell patch to be implantable to treat these inoperable uh, tumors. So here we, I show you the 41 metastatic breast cancer with the subcutaneous injected uh, injectable hydrogel. So our approach can significantly uh, delay and inhibit the tumor growth as well as preventing the uh, 41 breast cancer metastasis to lung tissue. And for some inoperable cancer like ovarian cancer, our lifelines, the cell patch can be implanted and can inhibit the tumor growth and prolong the tumor bearing mice survival. So that's pretty much of all the work I present today. So a brief summary and outlook. So here I show you that all these cells can be either engineered for uh, the therapeutic cells or can be engineered with the with the biological chemical engineering approach to as the delivery system to, to deliver drugs precisely to the tumor side. So looking by looking forward, so we do believe that this engineered cell can serve as a great candidate option for the personalized and the precision medicine. And uh, my group will continue to contribute our efforts to uh, develop this field. And finally, I would like to thank all my uh, previous and current mentors, all the lab members, uh, wonderful collaborators, as well as the funding resource. So thank you so much for uh, 
for the audience attention. Thank you. All right. Th th thank you. Thank you very much. And very fascinating work. Uh, any questions from the committee? Yeah, maybe uh, I can uh, start off. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure you have already uh, uh, had a similar question many times before, but as a chemist, I'm very much interested in yeah, uh, what is still needed in terms of uh, development of the hydrogel itself. I can imagine uh, once it is injected, at some point, uh, it will have to disappear from the body again, but maybe you want to have it there for a certain amount of time. It has to be doing all of that on a physiological conditions, which is maybe very different than the typical laboratory experiments you do. So I was just wondering what is in terms of chemistry of hydrogels uh, needed? What, what, if you could ask a chemist to make your perfect hydrogel, what would you ask this chemist? Yeah, so that's a great question. So for the hydrogel part, so I think uh, two points they still need to be addressed or still need to be improved in terms of anti-cancer therapy. So one is the, the biocompatibility of the hydrogel. So how much does this hydrogel can induce the immunogenicity? So that's one key, one key um, factors affecting the in vivo application of hydrogel. And the second thing is how to make this hydrogel less immunogenetic, which means, you know, one important uh, feature of the hydrogel implantation is that they always associate with fibroblast, fibro, fibrosis, sorry. So how to make this hydrogel more biocompatible and less immunogenicity? So that's the, that's the key question for the in vivo application of the hydrogel. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, if I can pick back on that, uh, in, in your data, when you do the surgery, right, it, it, when, before you open up the tumor, the call of the tumor is hypoxic. There is a huge expression of HIV-1 alpha and beta. But then when you do the surgery, you expose the tumor to oxygen. So you move from hypoxia to pneumoxia. Then you introduce your material that has been under oxygen tension. And now you're putting it in an environment that previously was under hypoxia. How do you um, actually correct for that kind of change in the oxygen tension in your in your tests and in your studies? Oh yeah, so that's a great question. But actually, we don't look into this oxygen changer in terms of you know either facilitating or inhibiting the tumor growth. So basically, we basically we just do the resection and we inject the hydrogel into the post-surgical cavities, and we do believe that there will be oxygen change in the in the residue tumor areas and but we you know we just look into the uh recoverance of the glioma tissue after the surgery but in terms of details maximum next maximum like the oxygen change during this operation as well as you know different immune cells or fibroblastic infiltration into the into the post-surgical glioma tissue we still need to look into that because that's the underlying mechanism to uh, substantiate or demonstrate the efficacy of our treatment approach. So, yeah, so, so, so basically, you, sorry, you, need, but, you need to have uh, a negative control where you have yeah. another tube that you process exactly the same way and look at it, the effective change in the, 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 the tissue there. Because I, I see oh, yeah, a lot so actually, of and nobody, I, I don't see yeah, anyone yeah. saying we have a parallel surgery uh, without any perturbation. Don't put even the hydrogel. Just open up the, the, the tumor and close it and see whether anything happens to the growth. The growth yeah, so that's a, yes, so that's a great control to, uh, to probably potentially answer your question. Yeah, thank yep. you. Yep. Very nice. Any, any last question? I know it's been a very long afternoon for some of us and long morning for some of us and others a long night. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, the committee. Thank you, the, 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 the finalists. We have um, taken a tour in science that is uh, absolutely fascinating. So thank you all. Um, and we will wait for the next cohort. And panelists, please submit your forms in the next few minutes.